Hello, everybody. Uh, I hope you can hear me okay and everything's good on your side. I'm here with the Don. We're going to discuss Submission by Michel Welbeck, a very landmark type of book. Um, so we'll get into it in a little second, but thanks for joining me, Don. No problem. It's great to be here. Nice one. Um, so, uh, you know, the way I wanted to go about, and we talked about this just a second ago, but like, I looked up a review of this book and I've seen a few book reviews in general because neither of us are, you know, that type. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a new thing to us to look over a book. But I, I looked up a few, few rev reviews of submission on YouTube and found uh, these academics these, in these kind of uh, lecture halls with their names in front of them and bottles of water and glasses like these, actually. But, uh, but that kind of stuff, like textbook intellectuals. And uh, it's very unenjoyable in a way to, um, to hear about a text like that or a book. So like we were just saying a few minutes ago, just two lads kind of talking about a book. Um, so I may as well preface it um, for the audience, just in case you have, oh, this is important too, spoiler alert. If you don't want to hear uh, the details of how this book unfolds, uh, sign off now, stop watching now, because we are going to go through it like that. Mm -hmm. So we want to talk about every aspect of it, really, because we're just, just you're, you're, if you hear this stream, you will understand all that's in the book. So don't uh, don't be uh, yeah. blaming us. You know exactly. Um, so I'm going to read off the the blurb at the back of the book as a way to show you how the book purports itself, or at least how the publishers purport the book. Um, as opposed to my own version of it, just so you know how it's presented. So as the 2022 French pres presidential election looms, two candidates emerge as favorites, Marine Le Pen of the Front National and the charismatic Mohammed Ben Abbez. Abbez? Abbe? Don? I'm going to say Ben Abbe. Ben Abbe, okay. Of the growing uh, Muslim fraternity, so a Muslim party, forming a controversial alliance with the politi political left to block the Front National's alarming ascendancy, Ben Abe sweeps to power and overnight the country is transformed. This proves to be the death knell of French secularism as Islamic law comes into force. Women are veiled, polygamy is encouraged, and for a narrator, uh, Francois, misanthropic, middle-aged and alienated, life is set on a new course. So that is kind of that. Now, what do you make of that as a, are you happy with that, um, with that as a blurb or? Um. It's a very sanitized direction? blurb. Like it's yeah. very much like it's just telling you like the kind of setting, but really the story <laughs> is really about his life, and and it's actually his life is a microcosm of Western civilization, basically, which we'll explain as we go along. Yeah, like the the characters in the book. Um, there's parts in it where I actually found it kind of funny. Like there's there's parts in it where you're you're kind of it's almost so over the top the way he describes things. Like I don't know what you would describe that as, but it's it's uh like he goes he goes out of his way to be excessively like descriptive about hmm. some of the stuff that happens like and yet he kind of he's kind of contrasting that with this other writer who we'll explain more about uh who lived in the 19th century but um he selects uh you know the kind of uh the references in the book are interesting because he references um this guy uh Hussman, who's this french uh i didn't know anything about this guy before i read the book now his name is joris carl Hussmans, and he he's basically he's his life is basically a kind of a reflection of this man's and he keeps kind of comparing himself to him and he was a french uh literature uh kind of giant i suppose you know whatever but um and he as we'll see like his life is kind of um on a similar path he's he's basically on on a path to somewhere he has realized that there's something awfully empty and wrong with the world and his life generally and the kind of the, the liberalism of france and it's it's um it's all a journey basically and it's it's uh it really, I think, if you're if you're a reactionary by nature, reading this book, I think I think the, I think reactionaries will get more out of this book than any liberal. You know, like there's red pills in it, like for liberals. But will the liberals go there? Is what I would ask. You know, I'm not sure they will. Like, I, I think the I think the blurb on the back kind of says a lot because it's like they're afraid to kind of address some of the deeper themes in the book, basically. Mm. Yeah, and I think we'll be getting onto that more uh, as we go forward talking about this. But the just to explain for those who don't know. Um, and even for those who do the guy's life so he's basically a lecturer in paris in the sorbonne and um he effectively to me it's like um i always say you know if you wanted to learn about the russian aristocracy what their life was like uh, you might read tolstoy and dostoevsky and all this kind of stuff or tolstoy anyway um or hemingway to learn about artists and like uh I don't know, like 70 odd years ago in, in Paris or whatever. And this guy is to learn about the 
the nihilistic, misanthropic uh, lifestyle of a lot of people in the 21st century in 2000, whenever it was released, 17. Or, oh, actually, that's worth mentioning. We, I'll get onto that in a second. The release date is important. But, um, but it, it's a perfect kind of look at that. And it's all the little details, everything from the way all of his food is kind of ordered as takeaway, his, um, his relationships to women, his relationships to his parents, his work lifestyle. He, he notes that he's an academic and it's a kind of a, a system that's perpetuated for its own sake in a way. Um, mm. And he's getting at all of these, the pointlessness of living in Western society. Um, it's turned up, like you said, it's turned up to volume 10 and it's just in your face and intense. And did you notice like the way he describes the academic environment? Like he, he really, he has a kind of a contempt for them. Do you know what I mean? And it's, mm. it's like, he, he describes like the conversations that he has, like with these, with these, these various lecturers or whatever. And he's, you can see, he's kind of like, he's seeing through so much of it. Like, and, and he just sees the rest of them as these kind of careerists, you know, they're not really looking at anything meaningful. And they're like, there's, he describes one, one situation where like, there's one of them is like, he's kind of a mediocrity, but he, he has sex with this kind of, with this lesbian he thinks it's a lesbian lecturer or whatever to get a promotion. And like, he's, he's, he's kind of cynically talking about this in the book. Like, you know, it's just very funny. I thought like the way hmm. he describes the people. Yeah. And he's, he, uh, that's, I think that's what we're int introduced to at uh, maybe for the start of the first third of the book or whatever is, um, is someone says, I, I said, I wouldn't get distracted by chat, but someone says I'm about twice as loud as you. So I don't yeah, know. I'm going to put that up. Um, now, yeah. Nice one. But, um, so, you know, you're seeing uh, the kind of the cracks in his life and the, the meaninglessness and emptiness emptiness of his life. But you, he's giving you a perspective on other people too. So there's this lecturer and that lecturer and this kind of girlfriend um, and that girlfriend. And he's he's giving you the take on that. He has a, he has a fairly um, a lot of critics and 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 that have described it as sexist and misogynistic. Of course, it's just characters in a book. But um, but it his view of women. Uh, Mm. would you what would you say about that <laughs> i'll be honest i was reading the book and i was going is this guy me but like i was <laughs> just kind of like i just found it like uh like very um like i, I understand like that that, that the, the leftist or whatever would find this mm. like incredibly but actually it's kind of the male mind it's it's kind of he's just cynical and mm. it's perfectly natural to be cynical about the others the opposite sex sometimes you know it's like we're not the same so mm. I, I don't think I, I i thought it was an honest kind of it was yeah it's a bit satirical it's a bit over the top like but it is I think it's honest at the same time, you know. Yeah, and but he's it's not even just women in general like the perennial woman, but it's um mm. women specifically now in the west. He's talking about um people hitting the wall and um these kind of um fickle relationships um and how they damage people and all of that. So he's I don't know. I wouldn't say a men's rights activist or any of that. It's not that at all, but he's a kind of a realist, um which is something rare in literature these days. Um so he's he's pretty skating about women. He has one that he likes, um, but he he notes that they uh, they always what is it that they uh, they uh, met somebody and he kind of goes, am I not somebody? But uh, but so so I'm just trying to get everything about his life in the in the opening portion. There's his relationships with these women. There is his he's just obsessed with this author. What would how would you describe his take on your man Wiesman? Or however you pronounce it at, um, at the start. It, does he seem sick of it, or still into it, or to you? He, like he, he can tell that this was something he was very passionate about years ago. But like he has, he is, he's kind of been there and he's done it, and he is looking for the kind of, um, he's looking at that's a story arc of his life, hmm. and he's comparing it now. So he's beyond the literature. He knows the literature inside out, and hmm. people keep asking him in throughout, like you know, to talk about this this great essay that he wrote, like or this t whatever it was, like a thesis or whatever back in when he was just getting his phd or whatever and they keep talking to him about this like and he's beyond it like he's sick of talking about it really like and um mm. yeah like i yeah go ahead. i have a i have a uh yoris carl wiesman here i don't know i didn't pretend to know or try to know anything about this philosopher he's just a kind of a subplot in a book um so i didn't go learning anything myself about him but just a quick wikipedia uh he was part of the decadent uh movement uh his writings were part of that and just a Wikipedia says here that movement was characterized by self-disgust, sickness at the world, general skepticism, delight in, in perversion and employment of crude humor uh, and a belief that in the superiority of human creativity over logic and the natural world. 
So it's almost like he's doing a kind of a, uh, you know, a bit of a meta take there where he kind of is Wiesman. Um, mm-hmm. And and it's kind of like uh, Wiesman was 19th century and he's the 20th, 20th century form of, of Wiesman in a way, which a lot of people will say, well, Wiesman felt that the West was collapsing and so does Francois, the protagonist in this book. So maybe it's just a constant uh, um, tiredness that people always feel like things are falling apart. But that was a kind of a liberal take I heard there from these uh, kind of um, these people who couldn't handle the book. Uh, I could get onto that how the book is received. Like, huh? like his body is falling apart as well uh, in yeah. the book. Like he's constantly getting sick and he's kind of paranoid about, oh, and he, he, well, we'll get to it later actually, but he, start, he gets very worried about getting older mm. and... Um, yeah, there's a very. It's funny. Like it is. It's 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 interesting how it'll kind of play out. Um, do we should we maybe talk? Yeah, we've we kind of outlined like what he what he's like. Um, and he's in this academic environment. So, I mean, he at the start of the book, like he, you can see, he's jaded. But then he he kind of he meets some interesting some interesting things happen in his life, and and he's living his kind of empty little existence. And then he meets this kind of this kind of uh, almost reactionary kind of guy by chance one day. L'Empereur. Mm. Yeah, the guy in the red shoes and the blazer. Yeah, he he sounds yeah. like Chad. You know, he's like Chad. Yeah. Like, I'm picturing like a Chesterfield and like a, a nice tea stock drinks cabinet and leather bound books and and he's kind of a he's kind of like this kind of connoisseur of culture and whatever. And he's kind of he's and he's able to explain to him like you know almost like what's wrong with Western liberalism today? Like what why everyone why everything is wrong? Like and and he's talking about like the political situation as well. So I noticed I noticed that uh, when he meets that guy, he's kind of having this spar with him, an intellectual spar, because the guy is a bit of a nationalist, basically. Turns out that guy is pretty much what, like, it's kind of inferred that maybe he's like a operative within the nationalist movement politically. And um, it's kind of hinted at. But he's having this spar with the guy because the guy is very intelligent, but he's also a nationalist. And he says uh, the Francois, the protagonist, or the guy, the narrator, uh, says, um, how he was a little bit nervous because he was out of practice with intellectuals of the right, um, which I think is a nod to the fact that, I mean, the guy works in a university. He speak, he does nothing but talk to intellectuals all day long or meet them. They're like the, some of the only people he ever meets. He hasn't got very many friends. And, uh, you know, he's out of practice with intellectuals of the right, which is just, you know, stating the obvious, I suppose, about, um, about uh, the academic environment these days. Um, and it, I don't know it, it. It it oh the other thing to point out as well is it does just in general the book uh, has a kind of scathing criticism really of intellectuals, journalists, and uh, uh, that kind of shattering class. You've something going on. Yeah. Uh, you've something on the boil there. Yeah, and as like as he's um, as this is all going on, like the situation is that France is becoming demographically Muslim, and he is kind of in the middle of this in the university, and he describes like seeing like the the Salafists like walk the women to the to the lecture hall and stand outside of it before he comes in, just because that you know that's kind of the the real kind of uh, extreme kind of militant Islam, and he's kind of uh, he even describes like the like you can see he he kind of part of him is he he wants to see short skirts like and he's he's describing seeing these women in burqas the whole time, and you can see he's kind of it it's, it's it doesn't sit right with him. You know, and he, and he there's a part in the book where he even describes like the like a short skirt and whatever you know what what that's like like to a woman's body or whatever. And um, he's yeah, he's a bit he's a bit. Some people would say he's a bit of a creep. Uh, it depends mm. what way you want to look at it, or maybe he's just being yeah. realistic. You know, um, yeah, and he's he's at home on on like Pornhub or whatever. Do you know what I mean? At nighttime, yeah, with, with his little takeaway dinners. You know, it's it's all yeah. very seedy. You know, um, he's also losing his uh, virility. I think that's a big thing as well. You know, obviously he's hitting his um forties and. Uh, He's not very healthy, and he's he's losing his virility, which is like the only thing he kind of ever cares about. Um, I think that's a big part of it. So with this guy Lampereur, or however you pronounce it, the right wing intellectual kind of guy, he meets the nationalist. He meets with him. He's kind of interested by him. The guy is telling him everything that's happening. It's basically like if you opened a Don video, or uh, <laughs> uh, and and you listen to like fifteen minutes of it because uh, it goes on like a four four or five six page ramble from the guy on mm. on like a like edited editorialized it's just a, that guy on a monologue talking about this is what's happening demographically and blah 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 
which is interesting to think of like Western, like academic readers and uh, kind of bourgeois people reading that book and just getting like, like massive nationalist Twitter threads basically thrown at them via this character in the book. But, um, but so would you say like, is he kind of uh, ch not charmed, but is he kind of um, taken in by it or, or not? What, what do you I think, think he's, I think he's, well, what I took from it was he's so jaded by the situation he's in that he just wants something, something, something exciting and real. And he's prepared to entertain some of, even though he's cynical of it, like he doesn't really, he doesn't see himself as a nationalist, but he, he sees the, uh, the kind of, the uh, just the manner of your man and, and his confidence and he's saying you know, we're going to do this and we have plans and and uh, and he's able to explain like you're saying like what's gone wrong like and he's kind of giving it to him straight up like a big massive red pill like you know what I mean like we, we liberalism is out of what well, I, can't, I can't remember how he phrased it but you know like Western liberalism uh, destroyed the family and destroyed tradition and uh, and uh, you know there's plans to take it back etc you know he gets into that i think as well like you know um he kind of hints that yeah like, like you're saying he's he's um involved heavily in nationalist politics and you know he's he's taken in by this as like a god it's something interesting someone interesting to talk to at least you know rather than these kind of windbags he's talking to every day but what's what's kind of interesting is that um or to me is that and i'm sure the author meant this or whatever it doesn't matter what the author meant but what i took from it anyway is um is a feeling of intense dislike towards the protagonist for mm. various reasons. But one of the big ones is his, a what's the word, depoliticization or something. You know, not everybody needs to be political, but he knows a lot. He suffers a lot and he can see all this stuff happening around him. You know, he makes those observations and yet he's always just kind of like, well, I'm an intellectual politics. I don't care about politics, mm. you know, so long as it keeps the kind of the, his like college student, uh, girlfriends his like little like two month f buddies coming and his takeaways coming and his uh easy kind of lifestyle coming then he doesn't really care about politics and it's only when he starts to see it encroach on him a little bit that he gets interested and he is kind of open to listening to this guy lampereur the nationalist intellectual he becomes open to it but there's so many times like he's having a conversation with one of the girlfriends and he says um he, the conversation about whether women should have gotten the vote comes up and he's kind of being playful with her to be like, you know, radical to say, well, I don't know if it was a good idea. She was like, you believe in a return of the patriarchy? And he says, well, I don't believe anything or I'm not for anything. It's that kind of um, blasé attitude towards everything. Um, very much. And, and, and it comes up a few times in the book as well. Like French intellectuals don't have to be responsible which is, it could be any Irish intellectuals as well. We don't really need to be responsible for what happens because whatever happens, you know, we're shielded from it. The taxi driver might lose his job because let's say immigration or whatever, but I'm a lecturer. I'll be the last to go. And the thing that happens is he starts to recognize that maybe he, he isn't quite as, as um, shielded from all of this. And that's when he actually starts to care, which is very contemptible. Uh, also, when when he's speaking to this uh, Lampereur guy, um, there are bombs going off in the background. Him, Lampereur, and a mutual friend are having drinks, mm -hmm. and bombs start to go off in the background, very uh, or in the background, very uh, symbolic. Um, so that's kind of that's the start of the that's kind of like the first act in a way, isn't yeah. it? And, the, and there's a few things like that come up as well, like like the like this is in the build up to an election, and like you say, there's this Ben Abbe guy is 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 doing well and. And he's describing like what you know the reaction is of various people as well. He describes the the left like is uh, was was kind of happy enough like to to work with them or whatever, and the nationalists are always divided, you know. And that's the it's the funny it was kind of true I suppose, but like he um uh he said the socialists and the Muslims basically work together, uh you know on a lot of these things and that they're actually not that not that different you know in some respects which which is actually kind of true like and it is he's describing the kind of real relationship which is there between the institutional left and islam you know and, and it's uh like there's a lot in this book that we'll get into it later he makes a few interesting references as well later on but politically um, and then yeah like the the thing about um this every basically everybody seems to be ganging up to site like side up against the national front so mm -hmm. you have the muslims and the socialists even though the muslims want to like uh theologize the education system and uh and um ed mandatory ed education at the age 12 for girls or something like that all of these kind of what you would call very 
basically kind of far right or trad or nationalist almost kind of style of policies like very traditional and uh i don't know patriarchal all of that the socialists go along with it they're kind of um yeah the contradictions don't seem to bother them and same with the media he mentions that that the media are kind of swooning before ben abe they don't know how to quiz him yeah and, um, and they're not really listening to what he's they're not really doing any real investigation into what he's saying they don't really understand these policies like and that, that kind of turns out interesting in the end but there's also he has this relationship with this with this jewish girl at this time or around this time it's, she kind of comes up and um and you know her fam uh, being jewish like there's um there's a like this interesting kind of dynamic where she kind of um is uh, her family are want, wanting to leave because they're worried about the situation in France and uh, he uh, he's kind of he's really disappointed about this obviously and even though it's kind of a very you know frivolous kind of relationship really like you know and like he uh, he um there's a, he describes this really uh, like his birthday is like he describes his birthday present in real detail i don't think I'll, I'll actually read that part out because it's actually pretty full on like but but um you know, it's just part of this thing. And then she tells him she's going to, she's going to, might have to emigrate back to Israel. And then he says, there's this really famous, not really kind of, uh, kind of poignant line in this, where he says, um, uh, you haven't, you have an Israel. I have no Israel or whatever, something like that. He says, which is an interesting, you know, it's a very, that's a very kind of on the nose kind of statement. I thought, you know, when, this is something that hit me when I, when I read that. Yeah, it did. It did, uh, rattle around my head as well. The, um, and I'm not, I don't like, I don't, uh, I, I'm not one of these people who applies every political phenomenon or base, and I'm not like in trying to insult anyone, but every, ascribe every phenomenon to uh, 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 Judaic causes. Do you know that kind of way, right? Um, so I wasn't reading into it like heavily like this, but I do wonder about um, Welbeck because he is, uh, you could say, uh, not, he has the gloves off in terms of talking about Islam. He, he um, speaks about it uh, openly. He has no qualms about it. Same with sexuality, even like describing like sex and all that. Um, he's he's um, unrestrained in speaking about uh, women and the nature of men and women, the inequality of human beings, all of this stuff, right? The whole uh, thing. But I'm looking at it then going, okay, this is a guy who likes to be controversial. Um, he's obviously heard all of the different, um, he's the, the philo-Semitic theories about Zionism and how Islam is a threat to the West and the Judeo-Christian values. He's heard that. He's surely heard all of the uh, quote-unquote anti-Semitic theories as well. He's a guy who clearly knows. So I'm reading it going, well, in the, in the context of this book, what's his take? What's he trying to say? And on one hand, he's being like, his, his characters keep saying, well, every time Muslims come to power, it's bad for the Jews. Like his girlfriend says that to him, Miriam. So you think, oh, he, is he kind of, is he kind of, uh, what's the word, channeling Zionist kind of talking points in here? But then he says, "There's no Israel for me." He points that out, um, and he also, I think, there's a little subtle nod there when he says, when she's kind of sad that she has to leave because her parents are going, and she says, "Oh, you know, I miss, I'll miss France. I love." Um, and there's a few dot dot dots, and she's like, "I love the cheese." <laughs> uh, and she can't say I'm, i love my homeland my people my country and i don't know i'm like is that like that that's like a subtle little uh um point he's making there and i only say that in the context of him being um unrestrained and speaking about all sorts of things i wonder how that fits in as honestly the ultimate taboo probably of the western world um mm. but and again like i say it's not a thing i dwell on or worry about too much um or excessively it's so just, it's, I think it's because like yeah. the the the, uh, the Jewish angle is interesting because like you know they are allowed to have a have a homeland like and it's and they're very vociferous about it. So I, th I think I think that's why it's in there. And there is a lot of Jews in France who are, you know, who have gone back to France so, or to Israel. So it is an interest because of the Islamization. Mm -hmm. So it, it is like it is a rational enough thing to be in there, you know. As, yeah, and as, he also he also describes how like uh, her and her family and her wider circle are kind of like have a tribal uh, tribe uh, a safety blanket of family and of community and how he hasn't i think at one point he kind of starts crying when he starts mentioning that but um but anything else on the brain there on in terms of our journey through the novel here um yourself or am i catching you off guard next and, yeah i think we go to the next section like is there, yeah. there's kind of that's the first part like he kind of sets it up his life and then things start escalating in every aspect of his life and of the political situation because of the election so i suppose that's the next thing to go to 
Yeah, like, I mean, what, what, so, <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, so, so let's say he, okay, so where does he go from there? I, again, I don't want to just walk through uh, every page of the book, but he's kind of, he meets uh, L'Empereur, he hears the kind of red pill arguments, the elections start to happen, and um, there's a little bit of kind of, uh, what would you call it, um, intermittent kind of violence, like bits of terrorism kicking off in here. It, it feels like there's a bomb going off down the street, kind of like frequently enough. It, you kind of get that mood of an increasing temperature as, as the elections approach. And I suppose, correct me if I'm wrong, but he decides he's going to get in his car and fuck off uh, out of Paris and yeah, drive and to the countryside. There was one point, for example, just leading up to this, which kind of sets up for him to leave, like where he's, um, I think he was, uh, he's describing the Chinese neighborhood in like Paris. I can't remember which Aaron Dismond it was, but whatever it is, wherever that is, like, I'm sure it's accurate geographically, like, but um, he describes like the Chinese, like he's saying, you know, he, he's got this kind of inner, like, uh, kind of little bit of racism in him, like, you know, even though he's like this nihilism kind of, you know, you know whatever, uh, at heart, he's actually a kind of a reactionary. And he's just kind of saying, like, God, you know, thankfully, the Chinese keep all the, the Arabs and everything at bay, like, so there's no violence in their areas, you know, because they're looking after things, you know, whereas, like, you know, he, the violence is kind of envisaged on the kind of native population and in the, in the migrant ghettos, you know, it's just interesting. And then he goes off on the, yeah, he, he gets, he decides, he, because things are kicking off so much, he decides he has to get out of Paris and uh, he heads off to, uh, he just, he just, he just starts driving basically. And um, he gets a hotel in Martel, which is obviously the town named after Charles Martel. And uh, if anyone doesn't know, I'm sure you, you know anyway, but Charles Martel was um, this famous like, uh, you know, hero in, in France who drove back the, uh, the Muslims basically and defeated them in the Battle of Tours, I think it was called, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's it. So, uh, yeah, he goes, he he just keeps driving and he, he just there's a really funny part where he describes like going into a petrol station and like there's someone has someone has been killed in the petrol station and he just walks over the body and gets a tuna sandwich <laughs> and he just gets off and get leaves and he heads off on his way and uh. It's just yeah, like Paris is or France is in is in kind of uproar or whatever, and he just has to leave. Um, what does he do? He goes to. Uh, I noticed, uh, I, you know, when he's on the road, when he's on the road, um, yeah, he's driving for like a hundred kilometers, and he doesn't see a car, mm. and it just that feeling of something. I think that whole uh, scene, you could say, is like a feeling of something coming to an end and something else beginning, and a kind of transition period. Um, which strangely enough kind of felt a little bit like now, to be honest, and let's not get into talking about that, but there was a, a little bit of a, I felt like, you know, everything is changing. Nothing will ever be the same from here on in. And you can feel it happening when he's on his drive. Uh, also as he's driving, he's switching through the radio stations and he, um, it, none of them are working. And when he gets to his destination, which we'll talk about, the Wi-Fi doesn't work for like a day or two. And then it kind of starts to come back a little bit. And I don't know, we're, are we meant to take that as some kind of like, uh seizing of power like from one deep state to another kind of thing where like it's like a kind of a regime change almost like you would expect in a classic regime change where like for example i've been waffling for the last week about um about um the yugoslavia thing and when nato bombed serbia one of the things they did was bomb the local television station to shut down communications because if you want to install a new regime and oust the old one you need to stop their propaganda and start your own and there's a little bit of a tussle period there, so that's what I took from his journey. It, it, it's you're meant to like insert regime change there, um, and it might not necessarily have been complete, uh, completely violent, like spilling a lot of blood. But in certain areas in the country, things changed. It was a little bit rough, and meanwhile, he's in his country retreat, basically. Yeah, and yeah, the uh, what does he do? He gets so he gets a hotel in this kind of. Uh, very just basically no one in the hotel basically other than him and uh he uh he meets this other guy then doesn't he He meets this interesting kind of guy who's almost like some kind of uh like intelligence operative or something like that you know yeah tanner and, um, or tanner, tanner or yeah, something that's like that. find the name yeah he meets this guy tanner and um and he kind of they get uh he gets embroiled in, in kind of telling them kind of bringing them up to speed on what's going on because this guy has all these connections and he's I, I'm not sure how this happened. He met them in a restaurant or in, I can't remember exactly, but they, uh, Oh, they just happened to be there, which is, uh, yeah. quite a plot device, but I'm no, I'm no critic, <laughs> but like, you know, um, big, it's a big country. Yeah. Uh, but, but yeah, he happens to bump into these guys. Yeah. Yeah. And he describes the, he, this is where he gets, he uses this, this character Tanner, 
to describe and explain some of the kind of in, intr- intricacies of like jihadism and Salafists and and you know and the, the Muslim Brotherhood. And he's actually accurate. I have to give him the credit. Like, I mean, I'm, I, as I'm reading the book, I was, I was wondering, like, you know, how much inv- he obviously has done his research into Islam because uh, he keeps um, he's on he's on point. Like he says, the, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood, for example, you know, they're not the same as the Salafists, although on the face of it, they look that way. But they're, they actually have kind of a, a different kind of they're all about political power, really. That's really what it comes down to. Like they're looking for power and the Salafists have this very, very religious zealotry. And uh, and this is the thing with Ben Abe because Ben Abe is Muslim Brotherhood, but like he actually turns out to be actually quite more honourable than you would assume. Like you, you, he he's not he's not a bloodthirsty um, lunatic. And this guy kind of fills in you know him on this like and explains to him like what uh, what a kind of a leadership led by Ben Abe would be like, you know. And this kind of, I suppose, this is kind of, yeah, it's a, it's a plot device to, to explain to people some of these things, but I suppose it's necessary. But like, and this kind of gets him thinking a little bit differently as well. And this is where you kind of see him, he's, his life is spiraling, you know, and um, he, he he's talking about the, like, the, the possibility of like a, a socialist center-right coalition to beat the nationalists and all this, like, and uh, he's intrigued by this guy, like, and they talk into the night and whatever. And, um, you know, they t- uh, he, he talks a lot about it. Do you know what that guy is kind of meant to be, as far as I can see, is like, and there's a lot as well of Welbeck throughout this book via his characters, showing how kind of big brained he is in a way. You know, he's he's got a, he's very well read and all of that. And he knows the different arguments. And with with the guy Tanner, it's almost like he's just vomited everything he knows from every big brain point of view into this guy's mouth. Like, you know, I understand the right because you're reading it from a reactionary point of view. You're going like, yes, he understands it, and I'm sure. And he's speaking; for, uh, he's merging a few different points of view into the perfect kind of synthesis, and uh, it's meant to be very compelling. But I don't know. Uh, I, 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 you know, I, I was never swayed by anyone in this book to not be a, like a French nationalist at heart, you know. And we'll get to that in the end. But um, but he kind of the Tanner guy suggests that. He, he takes nationalism into account. He's like, yeah, yeah. He's not like saying, oh, they're all bad or whatever. But he's just saying nationalism is dead. Nationalism died in the trenches of Verdun and it's exhausted. And uh, so is Christianity. And it's not saying that that's bad. It's just saying that it's pointless. I it, it, He almost says like, and there are one, more than one characters. I've forgetting, forgotten who in this book who kind of go, yeah, I went through a nativist phase, they call it. But um, I realized that it's just dead on the vine. And I'm reading it kind of going, <laughs> I can't help reading it being like, no, it isn't. You know, yeah. getting stubborn about it, to be honest. But um, yeah. how sincerely do you take it? Or how do you think they are just quitters? I know it sounds childish yeah. of me, but what's your take? I think, I think we're looking at it, you see, as Irish people. And we, in Ireland, like, this stuff is not as deeply ingrained like for as long. Like France is the birthplace of liberalism, isn't it? Like so, it's it's this is where it all started, the French Revolution. Like so, this force which kind of has now kind of spun itself out into the situation, and like they're demographically further along. So I suppose it's easier for us to kind of go, no, it's not. You know, like twenty years ago, the country was you know completely Irish, or whatever. You know, so we we don't see the we you know I think it's uh, maybe if you're French, you probably have a different perspective on that because actually demographically France is in a very bad way. But he uses this character as well to talk about like. Uh, like all this kind of political stuff um, about like he explains like the Gaul uh, and he, with the way he viewed the European project, like which was kind of like the British. Um, obviously, the 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 colonial powers like were kind of trying to maintain their own kind of spheres of influence while going into the European thing. Like so, the Gaul like with France, they have these 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 North African colonies or whatever. So although he eventually, of course, gave them up, but like you know, he was trying to maintain that influence. Like and so like the Arabization of France like is kind of has been kind of set in stone for like about 70 years really, because if you're going to have that massive like African colony or whatever, um, you know, you're, you're going to have demographic displacement like so. And he describes like this was back your woman who wrote this book called, I actually have it. It's called Eurabia is like that book there. Hmm. Like, and like, she's been, she outlines all the, like uh, 
the agreements which were made between the EU and the Arab countries going back to the oil crisis in the 70s. And he has all this in here. So I just found that. I just couldn't believe what I was reading that. You know, he's really pushing it like, you know, like he's there's so many red pills there for people if they actually wanted to look them up. Like, did you see any inter any reviewer talk about any of that stuff? Like, I didn't see anyone bring that up, like about like the kind of geopolitics that's in here, like because it's actually pretty on the nose, like you know. Yeah, uh, I kind of, I kind of want, I want to, I want to get to that towards the end, but but just a note on it. They, I, it's very funny the attitude these critics, these kind of people who are dyed in the wool liberal progressives or whatever, trying to deal with this. And trying not to throw throw their toys out of the pram because that would make them too obvious. Like they would become the characters in the book. Then, like, so they're trying not to be. They're kind of forced into a strange position by this book because they have to be like, yes, yes, yes. But you know, this is all an illusion or whatever. But it's like, well, that's what like that's what uh, Welbeck said. The lecturers in the book also said. Like you're just being the characters in the book now, which is funny. So they're trying not to be, uh, and it's very strange, but yet they can't just accept it all hook, line, and sinker and be like, yes, it's very interesting. Um, and that is the thing that up until all of this begins to happen, um, most of his lecturer buddies and stuff dismiss all of this talk, this nativist talk as, you know, uh, it's crazy talk or whatever. But crazy seen xenophobic, it, like, whatever, blah, blah. You know, speak. Yeah. And as soon as it kind of basically comes to pass, I mean, we'll get onto that in a second, but it's, the transition is very quick. There's no, like, actually, yeah, that's, we that's were what's wrong. hilarious about it, actually. Yeah, is that yeah. it's just, it, like, they just kind of go, oh, well, that's it, you know, and they just yeah, live yeah. their life. Like, and, and, yeah, we'll and, and, and later, they, don't, yeah. they don't insert, I, well, I was wrong there anyway. Um, so, no, there's no, like, mea culpa at all. But so he's in this, um, he's in this, um, we are kind of just going through the book, but it's fine. It's a good way to do it. Um, he's in this, um, this place. I think he at, he starts kind of visiting churches at this point, doesn't he? He starts to mm. do his um, kind of quest for meaning or whatever. Um, but yeah. I mean, there's not. Is there anything more in his trip, or are we yeah, well, back to his return? It compares the Renaissance to the versus the Gothic kind of era of Catholicism, hmm. and um, you know, in the architecture and everything, but also the kind of the. Uh, the, oh, he has a line here. I can't think what it is. But I can't find it now anyway. But but like he's talking mm. about the individual judgment. Um, you know, wasn't kind of as uh, wasn't as apparent early on, like in, in Catholicism and all this. Like, but you know, I don't know. I, I haven't got the line to hand now. But but yeah, he's just yeah. he's because he's trying. He's on a spiritual journey and he just can't relate. He can't relate to it really in his heart. He just can't. He's looking for like because that's what the submission is about. Really, he's trying to submit to God. Like, and he just can't bring himself to do it. Basically. And it takes yeah. this kind of political situation to, to bring him to do it, like. Uh, and uh, what happens after that? Yeah, did, yeah, your man gets elected. Basically, I mean, that's what yeah. happens, isn't it? So, uh, yeah. So via via the socialist uh, alliance, and there's one or two other, maybe even a centre right party or whatever. But classic, like post World War Two European democracy, is set up to keep nationalists out of power. I, I, that's the way I view it, anyway. Because any time yeah. you have an election, like after the migrant crisis. Um, whether it various different European countries, Austria, Denmark, whatever, they can, like they would have this sizable nationalist uh, uh, political uh, wing, or going for election, and uh, they would. Yeah, it's like, isn't that funny that democracy like coalesces against one specific group always, mm -hmm. as if it is this satanic thing, you know? Um, and that's what happens here, basically. Um, and and despite them all saying, oh well, uh, nativism would be too bad. That's terrible. We can't allow that. But they're fine to allow. Uh, well, we'll get onto it. <laughs> um, so I, I mean, he basically comes home at that point. He returns. Yeah, doesn't and he? Like, the funny thing is, he comes home like, and he's describing like the bureaucracy that he has to deal with just for having left his fucking flat in Paris mm. for a few days. Like he just has all these letters, and and he's like, you know, it's just this bureaucratic state kind of, you know. You know, this is this is all like these are the institutions which have survived. You know, instead of the kind of the religious institutions, you now have this bureaucratic state with its thumb on you, like demanding to know where you are if you left your house for a while or whatever. And, and yeah, um, it is, it is, it's pretty horrific. Like uh, that, that feeling of there being a pile of letters, and and he's like sitting there in the corner, kind of looking like afraid at the pile of letters. It's a horrible feeling, and like it would be nice if we didn't have so much of that um but but what else what what anything else occur with this bunch of letters yeah. or well the, like the first kind of big tragedy like like there has been a few upsets in his life but now he he finds a, 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 the for, his mother dies basically and uh this is like the catalyst for him although he doesn't seem that 
worried about it. He almost writes about it in a way which is like kind of flippant, you know. He's uh, like because he doesn't have much of a relationship with his parents. This is where you learn about his parents, and like you know, his parents are living like different lives now. They're broke up, and she has like a dog, and his father has a uh, has like a, a a younger wife or whatever, you know. So he ends up uh, like uh, explaining some of this, like and um, you know, you can kind of see then this is oh, this is how he ended up the way he was, like because he he doesn't come from a from a kind of a you know, a kind of a traditional home upbringing or whatever. And he does, he's kind of alienated from his family. So he, he, he doesn't have any network at all, you know? Yeah, so that's, he's looking that's for a good point. Yeah. He, he needs a he, network of people. Like it's a big, it's a big team and it, and it, and it's, it's endemic in Western societies as well, of course, like, you know, you know what I'm going to describe basically what you just have, but you know, you're not going to find that if you go to, uh, I don't know, Namibia, you're not going to like, Go go meet your first random Namibian and then do a survey of their life, their circle. It's not going to be uh, nobody, <laughs> you know. And um, whereas a lot of people in the West are in that position or close enough to it. I saw recently that uh, uh, I'd have to verify this, but forty percent of Swedish households are one-person households. You know, that's a sad thing. Like that is the pot lifestyle. But he is he is really bad on it. He doesn't have friends. These girlfriends, he. I think he basically kept himself going with the girlfriends, with the F buddies. I'm trying to be uh, respectable yeah. here on Gerald Vision and Don Gerald and Don's book club, but uh, but his his F buddies, um, they kind of kept him going as it will, you know. Um, you can always have company from the latest Tinder pickup or whatever, but at a certain point, your virility starts to go and you start to get a bit floppy in the face. And yeah, like, <laughs> do you really want to be doing this at 50? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, unfortunate choice of words there on my behalf a little bit. But, uh, but, but yeah, so that starts to fade away a little bit and you are left with nothing. No kids, no no mum, no dad. His mum uh, lived out her years uh, depressed, alone at home, basically. And his dad, uh, well, let's get to his dad because it's a very interesting little bit because he realises his dad had for the last his dad dies too for the last five years of his life his dad had actually found actualized himself a little bit he had started hunting he'd met a, a kind of slightly younger woman or just a woman he liked and uh they drove around in a mitsubishi pajero and had the crack and you know and he's like what i never knew my dad at all really you know um he only ever knew him as a kind of a suit um a kind of a corporate company man um, and all obviously was alienated from his father, you know, never connected mm. to him, um, which is obviously a big problem of his, I would say. And a lot of people, of course, don't even have a father to begin with. But yeah, he's totally alone. Um, any thoughts on all that? Or yeah, well, I I just thought that it 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 was it's 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 key to forming his character, like, and mm. you can see like that he doesn't even have any 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 real emotional response to it, really. You know, like he he, he does later, like he because he, he breaks down basically, but like he doesn't viscerally have a, a response, like when he hears about this. You know, he's all like about he just describes you know the the money that was left and is divided this way, and you know he doesn't seem to have this real like uh, connection at all with his parents. Like you know, they're just mm. other people. That happened to rear him, you know. Hmm. Um, and it, there's it also like when the um, like, this is going on. Also, like he, uh, the university is being taken over by uh, by Qataris or something. And this is where it gets kind of funny because like this, uh, like this mediocre like lecturer uh, that he was he, he met met before, like you know, kind of comes in like and he says, as I expected, he had accepted a position at the new university. He was teaching a course on Rimbaud. He clearly found the situation embarrassing. And he added, unprompted, that the new administration hadn't interfered at all with the content of his course. That is to say, Rimbaud's conversion to Islam was presented as a matter of historical fact, though this was controversial, to say the least. But when you when it came to analysing the poems, he really had been left alone, and that's what counted. The longer I listened without any sign of indignation, the more he relaxed, and in the end he invited me for coffee. It took me a long time to make up my mind, he said, once he ordered a muscadet. I nodded, full of warmth and understanding. I figured it had taken him 10 minutes tops, but the salary was pretty attractive. Even the pension isn't bad. The salary is a lot better. How much better? Three times more. So basically he's just describing how we, like all of these academics really give a shit about like, was the money like, and they were happy to pretend that Rimbaud was converted to Islam and do what, you know, this is these really ahistorical things like, because, you know, I for one welcome our new Muslim overlords, that kind of attitude, you know? And does he, is he uh, does he, uh, does he engage in uh, his wife, uh, uh, brides, are we there yet? Am I spilled the beans? But like he does start. Oh, yeah. 
So yeah, I mean, it's the, the polygamy thing comes in pretty soon uh, along here. Um, and that is a big thing. I don't know. There are parts of it to me as well, by the way, that just seem a bit, there's something a bit surreal and unrealistic about some of it, you know, where like, I'm the first, I'm not going to like the whole counter jihad thing, the, the worst case scenarios about Islam and all of that. Some of them, uh, they have a point, but you know, there is something slightly cartoonish about he comes back and all of his timid lecturers are now walking around with sick brides. <laughs> you know, it's like, uh, okay, maybe like a little bit, but I don't know. It's all a bit quick. It's all a bit cartoonish a little bit like, you know, but, um, but it's a, it's a fair point as well. But, um, I don't know, little, there are surreal moments and maybe it's just to make a point from Welbeck, but he, like his mother dies and he doesn't care. I suppose Welbeck is just trying to make a point, but it almost seems unreal. Uh, yeah. The head station thing where he just steps over the body. Like, mm. wouldn't you try to call the police? I'm getting a bit down. I know, in- yeah. <laughs> uh, maybe I'm taking it all too seriously, but you know, there are bits like that. Like he comes back and it's like, welcome back to Paris. We all now have 13 year old brides uh, exactly <laughs> it's like i don't know what it happens quite like that but it does get a bit surreal from there on in um and i suppose there is truth to it it could go that way slightly but i mean where are we in it yeah. here will be no, as, yeah like, as this is happening like then later on like he finds out like because as during during his trip away down to the south to martello whatever like he's uh, he's constantly trying to find out is this girlfriend of his after contacting them, you know, and he's con- he's uh, it was, uh, no, numerous times during the story he's commenting on like as she is left now he's just he's just he's, he's he's expecting the dear John letter like any day now you know and it's like she, uh, as I expected she she started to contact me less frequently and the messages you know she stopped signing them with a kiss and then like the next day it's like there's a few extra days before she wrote the next time in the email mm-hmm. or whatever and then one day it's like. Uh, did she even contact him? I'm trying to remember. I think she said she 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 met someone or something. Oh no, that was what he saw a picture of her uh, with some other man or something, wasn't that it? There was some I can't think what it was exactly now. Yeah. But, you know, her IDSBF. Just, you know, um, yeah. um, you know, yeah. So she's she's gone. She bounced. She's gone. So uh, and he knew Addison. all along that she would like, but he just mm. kind of kept going with it even though he knew like she was gone like he knew there was no hope of ever being a relationship there but he just he just kind of went with it because he just he wanted it to, to go somewhere but he knew it wouldn't but he, he mm. nor nothing else to do so then he gets a threesome and he just goes to these prostitutes like and he just he, you know he's trying to perform and he's he's old and it's not working and he's like but i think he actually manages at that point and i can't remember but you know yeah, just, he just he just does these things like he, he constantly going to prostitutes like you know what i mean for yeah. like that's that's his reaction to breaking up like he's like i'm getting hookers you know yeah, uh, Welbeck as well. By the way, I have a like a diary book kind of thing here, full of like it's got like twenty pages of notes. But as expected, I can't. Um, and you'll relate to this. I can't actually access any of them because we're live, and I've just got pages and pages of un, un, um, or uh, disorganized notes. So I'm just gonna have to kind of abandon them. Oh yeah, I have found one actually that I needed. Um, Welbeck in an interview somewhere said prostitution is one of the foundations of West and of course he's known as a bit of a provocateur so who knows Um, prostitution is one of the foundations of Western civilization it's a corrective to monogamy Um, oh and by the way it's also worth noting that Welbeck um, has a had one or two marriages his third marriage marriage was in September 2018 to Quinyon Lisi Lee a Chinese woman, 34 years his younger, and a student of his works. So, you know, this whole question we'll get to in a while of like, uh, you know, how much does the author actually believe, uh, you know, is the author the protagonist in a way? Or oh, maybe he isn't. Maybe it's just a, a whatever. Uh, you know, I suppose it's a, it, this maybe is for the conclusion, really, but I kind of dislike the author and the protagonist equally because like this, this um, how did I get to this anyway? We were talking about the polygamy. Oh yeah, the girlfriend hmm. and the prostitute. So like you know, it's I, I'm sickened by it personally. Um, I know I've heard these big brain arguments that prostitution actually is good in certain ways and all that. That's fine as a political societal argument. But to me, I've always been um, people can like call me the sissy or whatever it is, right? But the you know the whole thing you're away with a bunch of lads in the strip club here or there or something like that. Uh, whatever it is i've always been like nah you're good like i'm sickened by that kind of stuff in general <laughs> um and i'm not judging anyone in the chat lads but uh but um 
but so I just don't and and his is so disgusting and horrible. Like it's the seediest thing in the whole world. Um, mm. I have yeah. I know I'm t- taking the book too seriously, but there's there's um I have a note here somewhere that like when he comes back, the fact that all the women are veiled, he's kind of uh, released yeah. from the temptation of the flesh, and he's kind of like he's relieved and i agree it's it's a there's a point there like you know is that like you're the 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 vice of lust will go away if you're deprived Mm. from it you know if you go away camping with the lads you won't spend a week kind of distracted and all of that because you just forget about it and that i have a note in my thing here somewhere that like oh he's released from the temptations of the flesh but then he's also writing loads of prostitutes so you know there's that too but yeah. well, what are your thoughts on, on, on all of that? I've yeah, but like, like like you're saying, how that happens so quickly, he comes back and all these guys that were like, you know, all of a sudden they're all like happy with this, like, you know. Uh, and then like he describes the successes of Ben Abbe. Like he has made society actually way better in so many ways because he has veiled women. He, women have left the workforce, so there's all this employment opportunity and the workforce is less sexualized and all this kind of flows from that. And, uh, you know, he says crime is down 90%. And, and all this and then there's like all the kind of political stuff again so we're saying like morocco plans to join the eu and the you know there's like a family subsidy so it's all this basically all this kind of all the stuff that europe should be doing without islam like he's basically saying is happening because of this ben abbe character like he was kind of a i would say he's almost like an arab socialist like really he's, he's more of an assad isn't he i think that's what i took from yeah him. an arab socialist uh slash european muslim caesar type yeah. figure um, yeah, he's rebuilding pan- the Roman Empire, basically. Exactly. Yeah, and um, that's what it is. It's like a revival of it, but done by a Muslim, not by mm. a, I suppose whatever Caesar was. But um, but so all that political stuff is doing its thing, and uh, I suppose the rest of the book is a struggle, an internal struggle for him. He he's his life is reaching. It's basically reaching a crisis point. Like as awful and depressed as his life has been, it's get it's reaching reaching a climax of misery. Um, while society is moving kind of in the other direction um, and he's trying to reconcile all of that basically yeah yeah um, and actually I, I think it was distributism he was talking about more than anything that, that, that was because you're ben, yeah. your man Ben Abbe that's what I meant I should have said I should have said that he's not in soul he's, he's a distributist so he's he said that is actually in line with Islam but yeah you're right he he, go, he gets really his life is, is, is spiraling out of out of all control basically and his uh he doesn't he's worried about the future he keeps having these like uh panics about like his health and what's what's he gonna do is he, who's gonna wheel him around when he gets older he he hurts his leg or something and then he's he's like what happens if like I'm, i i die like this like you know that kind of way and um should have thought about that yeah should have thought about that when uh and you know he's thinking of miriam his jewish uh, girlfriend yeah. And he's like, oh, we never did go on holidays and stuff. It's like, you know, obviously the point there is like, well, maybe you should have thought of that back in the day and actually uh, said, let's go on a holiday, committed a bit, I've been some way like a decent human being when you were on top, which is a big theme, I think, that young people don't understand at all. You see it with uh, young women, these like 22-year-old girls who are like living the dream, like whole life, you know, this kind of um, living my best life, yes, queen. And it's like, you know, you're young and good looking now. If You know, you have the power to kind of uh, take a good guy uh, to make one maybe commit to you, potentially. Um, but they don't. They don't seize, uh, seize kind of settle down and, 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 yeah. and settle, um, settle the future when you're young. Uh, people don't do it at all and end up very lonely. But um, even from a reactionary but, point of view, like yeah. what he's saying, like with the like, they're now all everyone is being basically paired up with those matchmakers like and like young men and young women are paired off like and it's just mm. done automatically and all this fuckery all this pissing around in your 20s like it's just all done away with like you know and you have children and you have a good life and mm. people are actually way healthier because of it you know so ba- this is why the liberals can't really deal with this book that way they can't because that idea is just completely like and after, around. Like, you, know, you couldn't yeah. go into that like you know as a liberal so you have to kind of go back and well i think what he's really saying you know uh yeah I, exactly I enjoy, and you know i enjoy it, that it's... he's being provocative you know it's kind of weird. yeah yeah exactly it's yeah. like oh very provocative you know naughty yeah. lad like kind of thing but is he right like, well, <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah exactly right? um <laughs> as in what about it but but on that point of um of getting older and being lonely and and setting you know reaping what you sow basically um the what do you make of that scene where he meets his this kind of scene if i can call it a scene 
uh, the scene where he goes and visits the normies for the barbecue. Mm. Um, yeah. You know, that's interesting. He he visits, so for those who don't know um, or who haven't read it, um, he um, he has this old buddy who used to be a lecturer uh, or, or did a doctoral, uh, like a PhD with mm. him, but then went off and kind of uh, committed to the normie life. He got a job in the civil service and he meets this woman who works in a marketing agency and they have a house and a couple of kids and a dog or whatever. And uh, it's funny where the guy says, uh, the guy invites him to the barbecue and he's like, it'll just, he basically is like, it's just going to be normal people, by the way, just so you know. Because like the lecturer, you can imagine this lecturer, depressed kind of guy with all these normal people, like an alien, you know. But but he gets there and uh, and basically the the idea is that this normie couple and family are, are miserable. Um, and I think he ascribes that misery to uh women in the workplace to be honest uh like uh the fact that uh like he doesn't have a good little cook as he the term he uses in the book he doesn't have a uh a nice wife to prepare meals a homemaker uh all of that kind of stuff which kind of obviously would balance out the family and blah 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 i think most people know all of this i don't want to rehash the arguments but but they're mis but that's how he paints it um so in a way he's kind of the book kind of responds to our point about leading a normal life because it suggests that, well, even if you try to lead a normal life as a couple in the West, the West doesn't facilitate it. Um, yeah, all, the, all, all the structures are set up to make you do the opposite of that. Like, and that's what mm -hmm. comes across completely in the book, like, is that all of a sudden, like, the, all these things are just being corrected and the left is, like, shutting their mouth about it because, like, I think he he, he gives them so, he gives them education or something like that. I can't remember Ben Abbey, but that's what it is. Like, and all the structures are now being corrected straight away. And it's like, we just wouldn't do it ourselves for some reason. We, we refuse yeah. to do it ourselves. But when a foreigner does it for us, we kind of go, oh, isn't that cute? You know, and we go along with it. You yeah. know? Like all so these, it, was, these it, like. it was intolerable to do uh, in a national way, but they could do it with, with him. So, yeah. Um, so that was, that was, it's just an important to note that Normie experience. Yes. Go on. Yeah. And then he, he goes to the, to where, uh, I can't even pronounce this guy's name. Hoosman's or Haysman. What's, what's it called? Huisman. Yeah. 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 Yeah, Huisman, uh, he goes to where he, the monastery where he uh, lived for the last, because Huisman's life is kind of in two or three parts. Like he starts off as this kind of dour, uh, kind of nihilist kind of philosopher guy, writer. And uh, he lives as kind of a decadent life then in his, in his younger years. And then he eventually just goes off to a monastery at the end of it, like because, and finds God basically. And um, uh, yeah, and it's funny. I just I actually found this very interesting because the way he he's trying to kind of, He's he's desperate to try and find something that Huisman got from this experience, like, and he goes there for about a week, and he, he like it's all the little details that he describes, like about you know he just can't do it, like he he just can't get that because that time is gone, you know he's not in the nineteenth century, you know there's an but there's I, a radiator yeah. or no there's there's like a, a red light on the like a smoke alarm or something that's annoying yeah. him, and he hears traffic. And he just can't Trains, like yeah. get into it. Like he's just yeah, like he's in the modern world. Like and he just can't do anything about it. You know. Yeah, there there are trains passing by, and also the the uh, what would you call it the the uh, the facades of the various churches. And I'll correct me if I'm wrong, but I think there some of them are kind of new and they're kind mm. of cheap. Like, do you ever go to a church that's been built in like the last I don't know fifty years or forty years? These weirdly shaped churches and stuff, and you go in and it's weird. It looks like a like fake or something and he's so it's like it just doesn't have the 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 majesty that it used to have and so yeah he can't buy into it and and he's so he wants to but he just cannot plug into it and that's really at the heart of this novel yeah and i suppose this is the point yeah this is exactly the point like because um this is why it can, we can't kind of do it with christianity in his mind like this is why we can't we just cannot go back to that there has to be something new like you know this is all gone now like that era is gone and whatever comes next, like, will have to be constructed. But, like, for, you know, and this is where he sees Islam fitting in, like, and he sees yeah. the Islam then as simply re-establishing the natural order. And that's basically the, the message of it that I took from it. Like, that, that's what he saw it as, you know, we just need this more kind of, uh, we just need this kind of more militant kind of thing to come in and kind of whip us into shape kind of thing, you know, make us do it. Yeah, so uh, I'm kind of, I, uh, you know, I haven't, um, I haven't noted it down. It kind of goes from there to the next thing I can re remember. There is he, he okay, so he fucks off to the monastery and fails, um, and comes home again, and that's when his his eyes open up to Islam slavery, and it happens gradually. But he's kind of um he was originally sacked from his job, 
uh, kind of let go in the new Islamic university yeah. that's taken over by Qataris or whatever. And uh, but and he's been living. He they gave him a generous enough pension, so he was fine to just live his life doing nothing basically. Then he gets back and he gets letters that are kind of graciously inviting him back, basically like, "Hey, why don't you come meet so and so? You know, we'd we'd love your work on Wiesman and all this kind of stuff." And uh, he goes to these functions and there's like Arab leaders and and some of his old lecturers are like weird, like kind of they're in the cult now. They all they're talking about their wives and all of this. And then he meets a guy who I'll have to find it. Can you tell me his name? So it's just this Retting guy. What's his name? Rettinger. Yeah, Rediger. 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 Yeah, we're not French, yeah. so it's okay. Yeah. Uh, we'll call him Rediger from now on for the crack anyway. Um, so he meets Rediger, and what, what's your impression of this guy? Uh, I can't remember. <laughs> 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 I can't remember good. what I did think about <laughs> it now. Yeah. Uh, see, I, um, found, I haven't read this for a week, more, two weeks. Um, I'll tell you. I'll tell you. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, sorry, you remind yeah, me of that, um, actually. Yeah. He he's a kind of a he's just some oh, other yeah. kind of academic that he knows and uh, he's a bit of a Chad in a way. He's kind of Chad. He's kind of like um, a suave Chad guy. He's, he's living in and, this lovely part of Paris, like this really historic part of Paris, and he owns a whole like three or four story building, like in it, you know. And he's living the life basically. Yeah. Um, in, uh, <laughs> and, like, yeah. and and well, like in certain ways, you know, yeah. I don't know how much we can con con condone things or whatever. We'll. Uh, We'll see what what the crack is, but he it's this it's this amazing house, and then he gets there, and your man has like he walks in the door and like uh, he sees one of this girl who's like a young girl who's probably like a teenager to be honest, um who like, like 15, gets think, yeah. yeah she's frightened when she sees him because she's not covered and she runs away sheepishly, and uh, he learns that like oh that's uh, your man's one of his wives. And uh, then he has older wives. One of his older ones are the kind of good little cooks. They're the ones who like prepare the lovely home. And every course they bring is delicious and lovely. And mm. the home is beautiful. And so he's just charmed by all of this, obviously, right? It's You would be kind of looking around going, this is pretty cool, right? Yeah. What you've got going on. Um, and, uh, and uh, yeah. He, he's <laughs> offering him this opportunity, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, yeah. He kind of, well, he talks more around gradually. It's, it's a little bit of a kind of, um, like a coaxing in a cat or something like that, right? Uh, um, he, um, yeah, he talks him around. He gives him these kind of long-winded arguments as to why God is real, um, or God is true, or God exists. But actually, uh, uh, footnote that it's Allah. It's, it's Allah God as well. So he talks him around to Islam, and he's trying to. Uh, and then uh, Francois, the protagonist, leaves and is kind of mulling it over. He gives him a little book to read, um, and then I mean. We're kind of approaching. We're approaching the uh, the apex of it here, aren't we? The kind of end. I mean, how do you? Yeah. How do you? It does any more go on before we? Uh, well, yeah. He he. This book like is all about kind of like it's like an introduction to Islam for kind of Europeans, isn't it? Like that was the kind of thing. Like he's, it's and he's trying to he's trying to basically like um. There's a whole thing. He actually tries to explain why God is rational. And I, I can't find the piece here. Um, oh, it's a big, long scientific thing, like something taken out of a... It's like half like um, like this kind of pop science. Like It's like a Neil deGrasse, Neil deGrasse Tyson kind of uh, yeah. poem mixed with a kind of an Islamic uh, logic behind it um, about the cosmos and blah, blah, blah. Um, so he makes that argument and, and it gives him time to decide, basically. Or to, to think. He's like, oh, you just mull it over. I'm just t letting you know. He's ob obviously trying yeah, to twist like, Francois' arm. Like, there's a point, there's a, there's a bit of dialogue here. I'll, I might just read it out for the sake of it. It says, sure. uh, he says, he said, uh, you're right, I went on, that I don't have any solid grounds for my atheism. It would be presumptuous to claim that I did. Presumptions, that's the word. At the end of the day, there's something incredibly proud and arrogant about the about, about atheist humanism. Even the Christian idea of incarnation is laughably pretentious. God turned himself into a man. Why man and not an inhabitant of Sirius or Andromeda? Wouldn't that be more likely? You believe in extraterrestrial life, I interrupted. I was surprised. I don't know. I haven't given it much thought, but as a question of arithmetic, if you take all the myriad of stars in the universe, each with its multiple planets, it would be shocking if life occurred only on Earth. So yeah, he's he's kind of doing this thing. Like is that you know, no Christian would say that. Like that's a completely he has this kind of um it's almost like a kind of like his his version of Islam is a very like uh broad, you know, kind of thing. It's not like in any way uh, there's a part here about about um 
I can't find the part from the book. Sorry, I don't know where that is. Where he, he actually references that thing that he was given. But the ten questions on Islam. Yeah, actually, yeah, is that in there? So I can't find it now. Uh, yeah, he has this. Um, yeah, he he explains basically that Catholicism can't be revived. That Islam is the only answer, and that you know Europe has been hollowed out by atheist humanism. And he he describes fascism. And this is, I thought this is actually a very good insight. He said fascism was an attempt to breathe life into a dead, into dead nations, essentially. And I actually agree with that. You see, that I, I was like, oh, you know, this guy kind of gets it, like, because, um, you know, fascism and uh, and socialism generally, like, they're all responses to, a, they're all materialist philosophies. They're all an attempt to try and, they're just hyper rational. And fascism has this kind of, you know, race, cult of race or whatever in, 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 interspersed inside of it, like, but ultimately, it's it's kind of a, it's about social organization, and you know, it's an attempt to kind of replace traditional society with something materialist, and that's why it fails mm. basically. Like, and uh, he kind of gets at this, and he says, um, uh, "Yeah, he describes how he converted to Islam actually as well." Um, he yeah, started he says, out as a nationalist, didn't he? Yeah, nationalism was dead since eighteen seventy. Is his is his uh, contention like? Um, that's funny because uh, the other guy said it was uh, World War One. So everybody has a different take on when yeah. exactly it died. <laughs> um, but it definitely did die, and there's no bringing it back. Um, but Islam, Islam is very viable, though. You know. Um, yeah, he says I, I've never hidden my youthful activities. He went on, and my new Muslim friends never held them against me. To them, it seemed natural that when I started looking for a way out of atheist humanism. I should have gone back to my roots. Besides, we weren't racist or fascist, though. To be completely honest, some of us were pretty close, but not me. Fascism always struck me as ghastly, nightmarish, false attempt to breed life into a dead... Oh, yeah, I read that, dead nations and Christianity. Yeah. Uh, and he says, uh, with Christianity, the European nations had become bodies without souls, zombies. The question was, could Christianity be revived? I thought so. I thought so for several years with growing doubts. As time went on, I subscribed more and more to Toynbee's idea that civilization, uh, civilizations die not by murder, but by suicide. And then one day, everything changed for me. Uh, I don't know if I'll read all that, I, you know, but he describes basically then, I suppose, going... Uh, His journey. Yeah. Like, I don't know, it's, it's, um, it's um, that, that, that point about fascism and, and Christianity. Um, it is very interesting. And it's funny because... I do, I do wonder, like you know, the average uh, blind boy or Una Malali or whoever, right? And I don't want to bring them up too much, but you know, they, you know, like they would talk about all of this. Like, I wonder what all of this seems like to people like that. You know, know. Um, like we're debating like uh, Christianity, like fascism, like versus maybe that was a bit of a false start, uh, um, and and it's it's Christianity. Like I had a, a, not a debate, a discussion with someone last night about this who was advocating for why um, nationalism is pointless without reviving a religious instinct or a, or a Christ, and via Christianity. And I was like kind of saying, well, Christianity is so third worldized and uh, all of that. Now it's difficult. And we were back and forth on it. And, you know, and ne neither of us too committed to a position. Um, but to, uh, to Anuna Malali or whatever, this is all just, this is all just racism. <laughs> it's plain and simple. It's all just like, no, that's just racist. It's like, what is there left to think about? Yeah. After well, see, all in, that? In, to them, there isn't anything to think about. Like, you know, it's like bad. they don't actually, because if you're not, if you're like, they, they all go on, but like, we're challenging these things. We're challenging, you know, the patriarchy or whatever. Like, and it's like the patriarchy has gone 50, 100 years. Like, I mean, <laughs> what are you talking about? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, they, they, they go on like they're living in, in the 1940s, like, you know, and hmm. they're really not, like, you know. Um, or, you know, it would be if they were discussing the patriarchy, so to speak, quote unquote, if, if you were to challenge them to say, um, as a person who claims to be pretty intelligent, give me, you've given me a list of the bad things about patriarchy. Now give me a list of the benefits of patriarchy. So the bad things it, about it and the good things about it, the benefits it offers and the, the, the downsides of it. They would be like, they wouldn't have anything. You know, they couldn't talk about that to you or speak to you about it at all. There is no, uh, there's nothing there. So it's, it is interesting how these, um, how these, um, you know, nationalists can be basic. We can be basic in our own way, but like these guys reading this book would have be reading all of this. Like it's like, it's um, Chinese yeah, like what, or something, you know, like, like check this quote out here. Like he says, like, I, 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 and as I'm reading this, like ask yourselves, like what would Una Malali think about this? That Europe 
which was the summit of human civilization, committed suicide in a matter of decades. Rediger's voice was sad. He'd left all the overhead lights off. The only illumination came from the lamp on his desk. Throughout Europe, there were anarchist and nihilist movements, calls for violence, the, the denial of moral law. And then a few years later, it all came to an end with the unjustifiable madness of the First World War. Freud was not wrong, and neither was Thomas Mann. If France and Germany, the two most advanced civilizations in the world, could unleash the senseless slaughter, the senseless slaughter, then Europe was dead. I spent the last night at the Metropole until it closed. He's basically, that's, that's a brothel, by the way. It's like his fancy French brothel. I walked all the way home, halfway across the city, past the EU compound, that gloomy fortress in the slums. The next day I, I went to see an imam in uh, Zavatem, Zaventem. And the day after that, Easter Monday, in front of a handful of witnesses, I spoke the ritual words and converted to Islam. So what... Uh, like what would you what would a what would a liberal make of that? Like, you know, hmm. you know, like I can yeah, I, can, I can totally relate to that, like to be honest. Like, you know, yeah, I, and, I totally and, get what he's saying there. Like, you know. And I could or you could disagree with a lot of it in certain ways, but I'm like, they wouldn't they're they're not even in the sphere enough to to disagree with it. They would be like, Well, I disagree with the only reason I disagree with any of that is that like something's racist or something. It's very it's a very disturbing worldview. A lot of these intellectuals or whatever you call them in the West now have where they're everything that's interesting seems to be outside of the uh, conversation for them. Yeah. And all that's left is what uh, like gay rights or whatever it happens to be like yeah, stuff like, like that. And it comes back to this view of history. Like they just view history as like this linear thing. Like, and it's mm. like what's gone before is just that's over now. And like, we've moved on from all these ideas. Like, you know, hmm. there's no, there's no sense of a, of a psych of a cyclical kind of thing, like where, you know, well, actually, you know, nationalism has been reborn in, in various ways constantly, you know, and, and like Poland was extinguished, but it came back, you know, and like, and yeah. then, like no, um, no, no acceptance either of like, like I, I would push back on people being over the top about like, like again, obsessing with things. Everything's fine in moderation, right? But it's like um, obsessing over, um, like viewing every little thing in the world in a human biodiversity, gender realism kind of thing. It's like, well, there's okay, there's a limit to everything, but but it's a much worse extreme and a much more disorienting and unrealistic extreme to completely deny all of that as just uh, haram or whatever word you want to use for it. Yeah. That's just all wrongness that's all whatever it's like i come back to my point of like i mean what is there even to even think about besides the essentials of human life basically like it's it's very strange and yet back to the i mean back to the back to the text back to the story he has this experience with this guy the guy is basically twisting his arm as a matter mm -hmm. of business effectively um, but he's doing it like, very. It's not even well. clear whether he like he really believes in God, isn't it? Either like that was the thing. Like he, he like he's just kind of deciding. He chooses to believe in God, like, and in in the truth is like that's really all you can do. You have yeah. to just choose to do, to believe in God, like because you know the alternative isn't great, like, and really hmm. like that's what faith is like. You, you you choose to believe, like you you don't like God doesn't come on a cloud and and say hey you know I'm here, like you have to choose to believe, like, and I think every religion, yeah. not every, well, I think a lot of religious people would say that, you know. So yeah. I, I'm not religious myself. Like I can't, I'm not, yeah. you know, speaking from that perspective. Like I'm just saying, I think people choose to believe like, and that's it, you know? Yeah, it, it is. It is hard to imagine sometimes, you know, or, and especially for the atheist or agnostic person to, um, to look at a religious person. And the question is like, do you, it is just that it's like, do you choose to believe and kind of like talk yourself into it and absorb it and just wash yourself over in the whole thing? And basically the question that person would have is like, I mean, you know, there's no one listening, right? It's just me and you. Do you actually believe this? Like genuinely full on believe it? Mm -hmm. um, and I think an agnostic has a hard time accepting that. And maybe you're right. Maybe for most people, it is just a, a, a conscious choice that you just kind of go with. You go, this is a stable way to, to run your life. It's interesting as well, even for like the the like universe, the multiverse people who love their Neil deGrasse Tyson or whatever. There's that again. That, that's religion for nerds like that's basically well, uh, it's it's a yeah. it's a creation myth like you know or like or you know like uh they can come to the conclusion that yes we're in uh if you look what's his name and not it's not Bohr's because he was the the guy around with einstein but bostrom i think the guy who has this theory of we're actually in basically li living in the matrix 
um, it, that's effectively what it is. Um, that the simulation theory that that the simulation is not just a possibility, but that mathematically speaking, it's uh, probable that that we're in a simulation. And you know, the 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 kind of IFL sci or science, the I love science guys, can yeah. get to that level where you're in a matrix and you're basically on a you're you're competing to dimensional in you know. in life you're you're in a game basically and your job is to basically be as good as you can do as well as you can be live the best way you can or something like that uh within this world and it's you know you kind of get to your point where you're like well that's kind of like god isn't it like it is, it is, a, it is the exact same there. thing really yeah you know? so 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 it's like there are many ways to go about it but just the this the nourishment <laughs> that it can give you to say i believe that there is some kind of moral order there's some kind of meaning in all of that. And yet, Francois, up until now at least, um, has not been able to do it because he's yeah. a depressed um, Frenchman. Uh, yeah, I, that's I heard what a funny quote. Is, I, he's not submitting I, himself to God. Like, he just has to do it. Like, and like, there's no way out yeah. of it. Like, he's, he's never going to find proof. He's never going to find like this perfect proof or the rational thing. Like, you just have, mm. at the end of the day, you just have to choose to believe it. Like, and, uh, you know, at, yeah. at, at some level, actually, there are arguments for God, but, you know, I think for most people, it comes down to like, you know, you you have your faith. Like, I think I think I think honest Christians would tell you that they struggle with faith all the time. You know, yeah. when things happen in your life, people, your friend, you know, your parents will die, your mm. your fam, your you will have lose friends, you will have all of these horrible things happen. You know, you may be clinic, you know, very ill. Uh, you'll witness all kinds of suffering, like, and um, like it's very cruel in a way. To take God away from people, like I often like, I I have a real problem with atheism. You see, I really, I really have a problem with how atheists, especially when the the new atheists and these people, you know, I, I really had a like, I read they really pissed me off. Like to be honest, how they how they sneered at religious people and how they kind of scoffed and oh, we're so beyond this. Like, mm. and it's you're really not like you're really yeah, not it's, beyond it, it. Like it's awful. I went I went through I went through an atheist phase for a while. Mm. I, I'm I'm embarrassed to admit it now, but. But you know, and and just to return to this question of fascism or nationalism, I don't know. I'm kind of speaking on the spot here, or making it up as I go. But it's just it's rattling around in my head, like that it's breathing life into dead nations, and it's a pointless venture. Um, and you could, you know, the trigger word is fascism. Uh, you could, uh, I don't know. I can feel NGOs like like mm. wagging their tongues now, watching this, waiting for their quote. So I have to be, which is silly, but I, you know, say la vie. Um, that there is there is something about let's say nationalism that putting all your eggs in the nationalism basket something about it slightly and kind of coming up with it as a kind of a political nerd kind of a you like interest like oh we'll have we'll have we'll close the borders and we'll re reestablish demographics all and it's all this kind of state policy stuff and uh, there is something rings slightly hollow about it without and I'm not a I'm not a religious uh, mad religious advocate. I, last night I was taking the opposite of the stance against someone else. I was saying nationalism does need to be front and center, but but there definitely is something that rings slightly hollow about it on its own, mm. um, and seems kind of like I don't know. Um, I, I don't know what it is. It's it it it, it is that kind of um that idea that feeling of trying to drag something over the line as opposed to having it do it itself um i don't know where i'm kind of going with that really but uh, to be honest basically just that quote that rings through um from from ridiger um uh so moving on he 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 has a few dalliances with this guy rediger or rediger or whatever and eventually he um he basically i'll just come out with it he decides to take the plunge we're at the end um he he has a bit of internal conflict about it but he decides yeah let's do it um and i, I might point out as well as that the third time he meets this rediger guy or whatever he um he he they have a conversation in the corner of the room and the guy says um listen uh you know when i had you in the flat that night and we had the chat with all the coffees and the nice meal I went off about space and God and all this stuff, but I don't know if you can find that quote there, but he says something like, you know, I know that's a bit up in the air and it's a bit arsy, but ultimately 
it's um the real thing you want to know about is how much how many how much salary can you get and how many wives can you get and he's kind of like well yeah and it, it boils down to that in the end it is, is just this where he, what submission is is that the quote you're talking about that part um i wish i for all i criticized the professional book reviewers i did notice that they this, had like this, bookmarks this <laughs> this is the, book, uh, the story of all is the book isn't it yeah the book. yeah and he says uh he says, I completely agreed in principle. Story of all contained everything I didn't like in a novel. Other hmm. people's... Is that, that the book, actually? Is that the thing? Uh, I don't know. I'm sorry. I don't oh, really get this wrong. I have it. I have it. No, I, I'm, okay. I'm actually talking about something else. But I do That's have right. it, luckily enough. He says... Uh, he's talking to your man, and your man says, um, you know, that afternoon we spent at my house, we discussed metaphysics, the creation of the universe, etc. I'm well aware that this is not, generally speaking, what interests men. But as you were just saying the real subjects are embarrassing to bring up even now here we are discussing discussing natural selection and um, we're trying to keep things on an elevated plane obviously it's very hard to come out and ask what will you pay me how many wives do i get um so in in the end they kind of have this moment where they're like listen let's just kind of cut the shit a little bit here right um and you know for like when he goes to the guy's house the guy is drinking and the first time he sees that he's kind of like what and he realizes, like, they're kind of like, basically, the lads are kind of like, you know, like, yeah, you know, don't worry about it. We can still be a bit Western here. You know, all it is is just more money and uh, and uh, uh, multiple wives. You can still drink, you know, privately and stuff, whatever, right? This is just for the masses a little bit. Um, yeah. But just convert on paper. We just need you to just take the shahada or whatever and just do it. And then you can get your wives. You can get your salary multiplied by three and all will be good just do it brah um and i mean any more thoughts on that or will i just i mean oh another thing by the way because i've only read this once i didn't go over it i've heard people saying he basically takes the plunge he does his shahada and he converts to islam that is the conclusion of this book um and i've heard some people say that it's left ambiguous now to me it seemed like he just converted um he describes it as if he's going to do it kind of thing but um mm -hmm. but the the takeaway i took is that he just converted um, yeah. and the i'll give people seeming as we have just gone through a lot of it the final uh, the final verse here is rather like my father a few rather like my father a few years before i'd be given another chance it would be the chance at a second life with very little connection to the old one i would have nothing to mourn and that's mm -hmm. that basically now <laughs> Did you like the book? I actually did like it. Yeah, like I don't read. I'll be honest. Like I don't read very much fiction. Like so, mm. like my mm. review is like just a personal thing. Completely. Like I have no idea what I'm doing here. Like I'm just talking about a book. Like and that's it. And yeah, this I, isn't I'm a literature it. review. Yeah, it's it's uh, just uh, yeah. like when you, it's more like when you see a movie and or a film, and you meet your friend and you're like, "What do you make of that?" And you talk talk about it for a while. You don't like break down the cinematography too much. You just give your impression so i don't know so yeah. on that basis what i mean you know thoughts i yeah well, i have loads of thoughts i mean he keeps bringing um like ultimately like it is a very uh reactionary book in some respects like because he's acknowledging like that um that basically the liberal world is just completely fucked like and it's it just something has to change like and you know it's controversial because to even talk about the idea of islam kind of taking over a European country is still now taboo, even though demographically it will happen. It just will mm -hmm. happen. Like and France could be the first one, in fact, you know, and the, on the, on the, on the, like, on, like it, it brings in demographics. Like he, he doesn't say this in the book, like demographics, but basically this is what he's talking about because these, these, there's all this Arab money and there's all this like, uh, you know, completely broken civilization. And, and these people are, have, you know, basically, um, a way of life like which they're they're just bringing here like and they're doing it like and you know it doesn't really matter what we think about it really because it's just going to happen and um yeah like it's a very reactionary kind of book like he's telling it like you know it, it's amazing that it, I, i'm actually surprised to be honest that it is so well received you know there's all these like laudits like on the back and all like you know all these like the spectator the observer you know and I, i've seen loads of other ones like you know, rate, you know, it's it's one of the greatest buses. Submission is many things, comic, profound, and at times unexpectedly moving. Of the several suicide notes for the West, Welbeck has written this in his best, and uh, this is his best. Sorry, 
and that's from the observer like and it's like you know you wouldn't really be expecting like them to kind of appreciate the book that way like and to kind of say that like because like you know if, if you read their editorials like it probably is saying that's a conspiracy theory you know yeah there's there's something about it that slightly rubs me up the wrong way and i it's i it's a very enjoyable book very good book but uh to just read but and then the question of me being annoyed at it is kind of like is that the point of the book or whatever and you know did it mean to make me think that way i don't care what it meant to make me think i just you know i'll 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 play along right is that for one it's ultimately just kind of like a novel version of a douglas murray book a strange mm. death of europe or mark stein islam lights out or whatever right mm. it's like someone read a few copies of those and just said let me translate this into a kind of 1984 type of thing even the end of the book is kind of like 1984 like you know i love you big brother type of thing but it's islam slightly mm. um and it is just kind of like a translation of that now that's not a criticism because people should do that um but i i i get the same annoyance out of it that as i do from the strange death of europe which is like while you're prognosticating and kind of finding slight favor with um the intellectuals like maybe on the margins the spectators and the kind of stuff like that i even see these days the sun will do these interviews youtube keeps recommending them to me they'll have like uh, katie hopkins on one time and this and douglas murray on the next and mm. they're kind of integrating them into the discourse a little bit yeah but the annoying part is like exactly and the annoying part is they, these guys have present no solution douglas murray when he's speaking to these kind of people who are like and they do the same thing they go we're going to have a very controversial guest on. And yeah. uh, there was this interviewer, or not interviewer, a uh, uh, YouTube channel. It's a, like a small little YouTube channel. Um, I was telling you about this last night when we spoke. Her, her name is um, Mom Folding Laundry. She's a, an American mom, you know. Uh, she has a channel, and she reviewed the book. And um, she's like, all of these critics keep talking about how controversial it is. And she's like, it's weird because to most normal people, that's not controversial at all, you know demographics being a certain way it being kind of bad worrying about it but to them it's this big oh a very exciting play thing you know <gasps> how controversial and it's like it's only you lads actually think that really it was fun funnily enough um none of us do yeah, like regular um, people have no problem with this talking about these things at all like it's because, it's because yeah. of people like you that we're not allowed to talk about this and then they, oh, we're, we're being controversial here today that's because yeah. you censor everyone you censor everyone every day of the fucking week like and we have to then like, you know, have these kind of people come down on a cloud and explain to us, you know, I tell you that actually, it was a thing with Murray that actually annoys me too. Like I have his, that book, like, and it, it is, it's pretty good. Like, you know, it's just some good stuff in there or whatever. But like, what really bugs me is that then he goes, and we just don't know why it happened. And yeah. we just don't know what happened. And we, we actually do know what happened. Like we, we know precisely what happened. Like, and we know that there are people working towards this every day of the year. Like, and hmm. you're just saying, what happened to Europe? Like, oh. Oh, it just it just died, and he's like, it's like yes. Icarus Bowl, and it doesn't know what to do with itself. And this kind of uh, he's kind of weak for himself a little bit. And I go, listen, it's actually not as fucking highbrow as you make it out to be. You know, like you're you're making coin off it, and you know whatever, it's fine, it's a good book in its own way. But like, you know, and then at the end of every interview he does, he just goes, uh, someone will say, well, you know, what do we do? And it's always this kind of just throwing the hands up. Well, as, uh, yeah, there's no answer at all, like because the answer is, is is in your face, like the answer yeah. is nationalism. The answer is yeah. acknowledging demographic reality. The answer is repatriations, things like this, like this this way of looking at things. Like they came in, mm -hmm. they can go home. It's as simple yeah. as that, you know. And, and exactly. About that. And and he'll kind of do the whole like, oh, uh, oh, you know, it's very bad and all that. And what it does is it allows some very, very dark, very dark people way out there yeah. on the right you know those this people kind of who've been like, right like those people who have I'm, been right for and years I'm like, like yeah and i'm like you, you're telling us our entire civilization is going to fall apart and we're going to have to pay a jizia and uh yeah. it's, we're, our, our, it's the death of our civilization and all of this but then you tell us like fuck off you know and uh, but then you're also making a kind of a, a name for yourself on the the wallowing of it all but you have a big massive kind of a gateway behind you on like someone saying well the obvious thing a normal person like this uh, woman in this review too she's just folding her laundry in the video and it's far from the new york people uh, reviewers couldn't come to this and nor could like you know a, a, a kind of a 
a sit down between Mark Stein and himself and Katie Hopkins, all of them. It's yeah. like, what are and you then like, Joe what? Rogan interviews Jordan Peterson, and then Jordan yeah. Peterson interviews Joe Rogan, and then yeah. you know, uh, what's his name? Uh, Murray interviews Jordan Peterson, and then Peterson and those Weinstein guys interview Joe Rogan, <laughs> you know, and it's like this kind of like constant yeah. thing. But the main thing yeah. is they don't talk to people like us, you know what I mean? Because yeah. we're the dangerous never, never, one, never. Like, you know. Yeah, and 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 it kind of comes back to Welbeck as well for me a little bit, which is why, in a way, I don't like I don't like the protagonist and I don't like Welbeck, um, in a way. And the the question of how much the, the protagonist and Welbeck are the same guy, who knows? We could talk about that, but, but part of me is with Welbeck. He's he does the whole thing of like I'm the controversial guy who smokes the cigarettes and and I say whatever you know, um, and he insults the intellectuals for being basic and cowardly and all this and he has done a lot it's an important book and it does a lot for us grand mm. but like if he was really controversial he would have written a book that doesn't end with i love you big brother i love you Allah." he would have written a book where lamperer and the lads uh, uh, uh alter history <laughs> you know um uh, that yeah. would be a real like and that's what again i'm quoting this woman i'm gonna have to link it in the description afterwards because unlike any of the intellectuals this was a based american mom with like 800 subscribers who gets to the heart of it. She's like, I like books about heroes. I don't like books about depressive failure and defeat. And yeah, uh, it's almost and, conditioning you to fail. Like it's telling you it's over. Just don't, don't try and fight back, you know, cause that would be the ultimate evil, you know, cause that, and, that would and, be, you know, camps and fucking holocausts and things like this. Like, so we can't go there, you know, which of course mind, like, you and I know it wouldn't, but you know, no, you know, that's the, that's the narrative that's put on these things. And it's like, Welbeck is kind of taking that like my thing is like you're very controversial Welbeck but if you you basically did a Douglas Murray book in fiction and if you wanted to be really controversial you would have um you would have written a book where where France revives itself and uh yeah that and would it's, really you know it's popular yeah. now that would be a book that you wouldn't be seeing uh what do we have here the observer yeah spectator like you've said reviewing and being like very interesting uh provocative book they would be like no this book you can only get on like a some weird dark web, you know, it would be, they would be like, Oh, because obviously I don't want to get into it, but like, you know, this, like it's, it's that very same thing. It pr pr provides no answer. And again, I'm not saying like the alternative would have been race war. Now it, it doesn't necessarily have to be like that, but mm. there could have been France reviving itself and implementing in a, in a way, the same reactionary policies Abe did yeah, exactly. just nationally, but well, he couldn't I, do I, that. I I won't, I won't criticize too much because I do think there have to be entry level, you know, yeah, I sure. don't think everything, you know, I, 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 I actually agree with you. Like, cause I, I know I, I do have these misgivings about Murray and people too sometimes like, but it's just like, I, they aren't, they are a gateway to thinking because, you know, if you're someone in the liberal bubble, you know, when you hear like Murray talk, like I can understand how that, I'm just trying to picture what that would be like, like to hear this mm. kind of talking about islam and, and he doesn't know he has this thing islam, islam, islam yeah you know, and he, he, kind of fall, he falls the leg like you know like this and, yeah 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 islam, yeah, and, yeah you know, exactly yeah. Like he's you know he's whatever he's yeah. you know he's smooth and whatever but like you know to uh someone in the liberal bubble that is kind of revolutionary i suppose too yeah. like, that is you know like and that's pretty much it. They, you know I mean? yeah, <laughs> exactly. But they needed um they needed on that presented to them on that kind of plate. And in a way, these intellectuals had to get it on the plate of another intellectual, this kind of author, writer, and via fiction and stuff like that. But again, I you know, the depressive like it's a big thing of mine. Like one of my guiding philosophies on everything is like I I reject the nihilistic and the misanthropic at all times every time it jumps in front of me like a target range i try to like shoot at it like hit the target and you know it, to me it's like get away from me i don't like it and i know it sounds kind of ignorant that i'm it's not like i'm afraid of it but i just um you know and again i enjoyed the book obviously but um but just there's a there's an element of that depressive and you know i mean you take one look at welbeck he looks like francois i mean that's another question. Where where do you think that lies? Welbeck versus Francois. Do you think he is like putting these like long like five five page red pills coming from Lampereur? Like is that just um is that just uh Welbeck doing propaganda? 
is he is he like just like is is that he's not that's not his real opinion is that what you're saying like like or is it his opinion is that what you're saying no is it i'm saying is it his opinion is he just using this as yeah. a way to just red pill everybody i keep thinking about this and i i uh I don't know, like, I actually don't mm. know. And, and I deliberately didn't uh, kind of look up because I, I didn't want to have my reaction be just, like, the conventional reaction, like, you know, because there probably is an answer that he probably told me. I, I don't know. I didn't actually mm. look it up to find out what he had written, what he had said about the book. Like, I wanted to just take the book for what it was, you know. So yeah. I would say my instinct tells me that, like, anyone who wrote that way would have to have, like, some... Uh, like sympathy to those opinions like even even if he's just still a liberal or whatever who uh is just anti-islam do you know what i mean like even like because he, he clearly does know some of the, the kind of the realities like you know and and it's not like the, the book isn't um inaccurate like i I think his his depiction of what france would be is not that far off like because it probably would maintain a kind of a liberal a more liberalized islam you know it would it wouldn't uh you know, like it doesn't have to be like this kind of jihadist stuff. You know what I mean? Like there are like moderate, there are moderate Muslims. You know, and uh, I think his views are he's he's just. I think he wanted to be controversial. He definitely seems to get off on being controversial, and I suppose like it is it is a controversial thing to su to suppose that Islam will be the savior of Europe, especially mm -hmm. when you're not you're not allowed to even consider that that could be a reality. Like you know, it, it could actually happen like demographically very soon. You know, so I, for There's, that reason, it tells me he's probably somewhat coming around to those ideas. Like, but I, I don't, I don't think he's a reactionary, really. I, I, but at the same, I accept your point that like you can't know that much and just be like, oh well, I'm really a liberal. It's just me. It's an intellectual exercise, you know, via characters. Obviously, you can't know all that and not have that position yourself a little bit. Um, one thing I find um interesting about the book is they kind of it layers in upon itself, and I do wonder. If he was being very big brained in 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 his kind of in that you have the story happening, but then there's all of these, and we're not going full literature review here, but I'm just in a normal way, I'm just saying mm. there are layers here. And f here's one thing that's uh, just a coincidence, but I think it was the chat maybe you could say or whatever, but it was Jul uh, January, I think the 5th or the 7th, I think it was the 7th, uh, 2015, that was the day submission was released. And that was the same day Charlie Hebdo was gunned down. The very same day, yeah. um, which is unreal. It's like his book came to life as he released it. That is amazing, it. yeah. Yeah, Jesus. it's incredible that. And uh, another thing is that when he, one of his friends, he uh, one of the Charlie Hebdo guys was a buddy of his, um, and that mm. hit him hard and he ended up himself under police protection 24 hour after all of this happened because really? he's kind of a target. And um he he fucked off to Ireland. He lived on Bear Island in Cork for like years and years and years. I think he's moved back now. But for years after the release of this, he lived in Bear Island in Cork, which is just like Francois when shit goes down. He ends up mm. having to bounce off to the countryside. Um, another thing is obviously the Wiesman thing. Like Wiesman converted to Christianity as an answer to his despair uh, when he was 44. And Francois converts to Islam when he's 44. So that's a little note. And then another thing that interested me is that I kept having contempt for Francois and kind of Welbeck in a way, being like, you fucking pieces of shite, basically. Like, you treat these nationalists. Francois is, like, dismissive of it all. And then when it starts to happen, he just runs away and he's all about himself and stuff. And it's like, well, why didn't you just join the National Front Resistance? And, what, like, what, what's wrong with you? Like, you know, you yeah. all you did... And there's another note of where, like, he he gets a taxi ride at some point and he says that the taxi driver was a guy of the rare breed who genuinely cared, seemed to want you to have a good time or be happy or something like that. And he makes a note like that. He goes, in other words, he was genuinely nice. Mm. And I'm like, yeah, he was nice. Unlike you, you fucking arseholes. I, I like, I have so many lines in here. I can't say it. it's the C word. C U N T. <laughs> like in, in my notes here, I've written, I have yeah. the word, that word written about 10 times. Cause I'm like taking it. Obviously if Welbeck were here, he'd be like, well, I was meaning to make you feel like that, but yeah. you know, there's, there's, there's a bit. So I have this criticism where I'm like, well, what about, you know, what about just being a nationalist and not being a nihilist and kind of self-absorbed the entire time? Uh, oh, and with the taxi driver guy, I was like, yeah, that taxi driver is probably based enough and a nice guy and a wholesome man who isn't constantly like, oh no, I'm, I'm, I don't know what in my life means. You know, the taxi driver probably is sound and probably would stand up for his community and his country. 
And I'm like, well, maybe that's why, maybe, maybe having people like you, Francois, uh, in charge of our civilization for the last like 50 yeah. years is why we and you fucking ended up converting to Islam and uh, taking a triple salary and 10 brides or whatever. Yeah. So fuck you. And then also, then the, the, the crux of this though is that there's a bit where he's talking to Lampereur and uh, they're chatting away and your man's kind of like saying, here we kind of have a, you know, a program of action here kind of thing. We believe this and that, how to resurrect the West. And he's the nationalist guy. And uh, at one point, Francois says something to him and there's a line, I, I don't have it here, but um, uh, it's just kind of thrown in there where a contemptuous smile played. Uh, he basically, um, he says like a contemptuous smile played over Lampereur's lips, mm. just mid conversation. So, you know, it's describing, oh, he's his eyebrow raised, his this, that. And one of it is that he had this contemptuous smile. And I think Lampereur is looking at Francois the way I'm looking at Francois and Welbeck, being like, you fucking assholes. I feel like the Lampereur in the situation. And then I kind of go, did Welbeck put him in there self consciously, like self aware of that? Mm. Um, do you know what I mean? Yeah. And I, <laughs> That's I think what I'm saying. Whole- I think what you're getting at too, like, is like there's this thing of the expert. Like, we now live with the cult of the expert. Like, that's what the Enlightenment and now modern life, like, we we just live in a world constructed by experts. Like, right now, the situation we're in is we're in the kind of a dictatorship where like little experts with white coats come on the television and and you know because they kind of repeat the uh, you know the uh, the prayers. You know, like they're, they're priests in lab coats, basically. Is what I'm saying, we have a secular um, you know kind of a priesthood. And uh, this is this is like there's a lot of people who've written about this. Like there was um your man James Burnham who was a, who was a leftist, like but he wasn't a communist. Back in I think it was like 19, 1930s or forties, he wrote the book The Managerial Revolution, and it's all about this idea like that humanity essentially is is now we just kind of there's been a return to oligarchy, and we uh, like that's kind of you know, and Orwell actually Orwell actually critiqued him like, and uh, they had this back and forth. You know what I mean? And then Orwell wrote nineteen eighty four which is almost like a response to that's that society, you know? So like, it's interesting you brought up Orwell as well, because it's kind of like, you know, it's like a circle here, but uh, I don't know if I'm making this point well enough, but, but what I'm saying is that like, we have this like, uh, this tyranny of the expert and this like, the, this secular priesthood and they have no answers whatsoever, really. You know? Yeah. Everyone, that's, you know, uh, that they can't offer you any hope, like, you know? That takes us back to the Una Malalis and the blind boys and all of that. They, they have it's a pure managerial and they are ultimately a managerial class of themselves in a propagandistic way, but um, they're the ones who tell you what to believe and, and strive for the revolution, which you're kind of going, well, I mean, what is it? Um, but um, the, and there's another interesting little layer of irony as well in this, um, in that after the Charlie Hebdo thing, Charlie Hebdo and submission happen on the same day. And uh, you know, like I say, there's that layer of like the, the intellectual class, the way they're going, oh, it's very controversial, but also is misogynistic and stuff. And you're yeah. kind of going, well, you're being the characters in the book, and maybe exactly. I'm being maybe I'm being Lampereur, and yeah. um, and then also uh, was it Manuel Valls, who's like the prime minister or the president, whatever way France works. Manuel Valls, after like a few days after both uh, submission comes out and and Charlie Hebdo happens, he said, um, um, France is not France is not um, Welbeck. France is not hate. France is not fear. And I was like, you sound exactly, obviously, like those characters. I think he actually uses Manuel Valls in the book, who is all about this stuff. Like they keep saying, this is a, a, a threat to the republic, Republican values, these kind of uh, yeah. French Revolution liberal values almost. Um, like, And they, they claim that that's actually a thing. And I'm kind of, you know, my thing is when I hear Manuel Valls or anyone say this kind of stuff, this is a grave threat to our, our values and our this and our that, you're kind of going there are no values like this thing is a, a like basically a a material corporate uh consumerist um commercial uh individualist behemoth that's like that's like there are no values like you know it doesn't have values besides individualism basically um and and yes it's just yeah the it's character just personal licentiousness to do whatever you want like and have no consequences have no one be able to enforce the consequences of your actions upon you is really what they're running from. Like that's what that's why they're so scared of like the right. That's what really terrifies them is the idea that they actually you do have responsibilities like that are bigger than you. Your your mm. responsibilities aren't just to have fun. You know, you like 
th- that is, I think that's the real, that's what they really despise. That's why they're, that's why they, they can't even talk about it. They can't even entertain any, any of the arguments or the ideas or anything like, because it just, re- it just reminds them like that. Like y- y- no yeah. one isn't, no one is an asset. Like all, like we're all connected in some way. You know, if you want to be a drug addict or something, you know, you will affect your family. You will affect your community. You will, you know, end up, you know, that's the, you know, you can't separate yourself out. Like, and that's what the, that's the individual lie. You know, we aren't, we're individuals in a sense. Like we are, we have our bodies, we're all that. But in, in other ways, we're not. We are communities. Like we are family. We are, if you have genetic, you know, lineage mm. and all this stuff. So it's- and, and like, you know, even you becoming a drug, drug addict is bad for you as well. And there should be a, you know, for example, like I think a lot of Western people will have this experience of like the amount of mistakes you made over your own life in your own youth, and you kind of go, um, you know, there like you could have done with an accumulated uh, body of wisdom, civilizationally and down through the generations to uh, <laughs> to warn people. You know, you've people copying onto stuff, whether it's men or women. Take women and the 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 family thing. They're like um. They they were like thirty eight and they go. I wish someone had told me. You know, maybe uh, that it was a good idea and maybe even forced me. Perhaps you know. Yeah. Ultimately, that's that's the rubber meets the road. It's like and it's cruel. If, it's cruel on those people, like because you're especially for women, like you know, because men can yeah. you know men for men it's not such a big deal, but for women, mm. like it really is like uh, an awful thing, like to tell a woman it's like, existential. Oh, yeah, yeah, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Like. You know, and like I've seen it, you know, we've all seen it, you know, in our own lives, like it happened to people, you know, and it's, uh, you know, like, is that not cruel? Like, is that not the definition of cruelty to deny, to, to deny a woman, you know, the, uh, the chance of having a family so mm-hmm. she can basically be a corporate prostitute, you know, like I, I just don't see how that's good for women or forward thinking. I think it's an awful thing, you know? And it's, it's obviously not good for men either in its own ways uh, as a parallel to it, but you know, um, the the this um i'll link it afterwards when this is up but um or uh, like up you know after it's streamed but um a um there was this review done by these it's in new york somewhere it's kind of like you said douglas murray sitting like this it's it's people like that but half of these people aren't even douglas murray level they are kind of liberal progressive lecturers and stuff like that npr types precisely and it's it's so interesting to see them deal with it they're kind of like they're acting like what they do is they kind of go they go what they do is they go like they take they don't go the whole controversial they think they go we've heard all this before you know this is all kind of um we're not shocked here this is a kind of a they kind of roll their eyes at it a little bit um uh, and also kind of go oh, it's fun and interesting but but it's they do become his colleagues in the book at the front table and it's fascinating um, I mean, I don't know do I have any more conclusions to make about this book uh, besides um, not liking <laughs> the ending. And I know that's mm-hmm. kind of like uh, simple of me to say, oh, I don't like that that happened. But, you know, I would like to see people write books. And, and I recommend this book big time mm-hmm. to everybody. But just I would like to see someone write one where um, where things change a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I, I know what you're saying. Like, like I, I would, I would give him a lot of credit for making it. Like, I, I love the fact that he's just tearing the piss out of like the experts and mm. the academy and, and the lecturers and all these like people. Like, I just thought that was like, was really, uh, you know, it's um, I don't know. It's just, it's just so refreshing to see that you know, in a mm. kind of a popular mainstream book. Like, it, you know, it's, it's not yeah. like a niche book. This is a big selling book. Like, a lot of people have read this. Like, you know. So um, I, I'm going to go over it because I'll just kick myself and we're, you know, we're only doing this uh, talk about the submission ones. So I'm going to kind of take a sec to to flick through my notes here. Um, um, there's, so there's the Charlie Hebdo thing. Um, oh, this was interesting. NPR in an NPR review, they said, but if the insidious, passively accepted anti-Semitism and misogyny doesn't turn you off, Welbeck gratuitously, Welbeck's gratuitously graphic loveless sex scenes will. Now, let's go back to the start of that. But if the insidious passively accepted anti-Semitism, I was kind of going... It's philo-Semitic, huh? if anything. Like, Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. Like, it, like, is that the word? Is that the correct word? I don't even know if that is. That's like, the basically, word, it's yeah, pro, yeah. It, it's, it paints like Jews in a good light, I would say. You know, and If you consider it kind of a mix of victimhood and kind of reverence. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like, oh, we are victimized, but also we are to be revered as a, you know, this good thing or whatever, this good unit of people. 
Um, this is weird. I was like, where the fuck did you get that from, love? Yeah, it's, it, um, it, like, I think any discussion of that in a book now is just seen as, like, it's like if, if, if the black character or whatever isn't, like, the main protagonist, like, then, hmm. oh, that's, that's a diminishment of the, of the racial, you know, element, like, oh, they're, 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 oh the, of course the black character is not the main character, you know, this is this hmm. kind of thing now, like, so every, every film has to be looked at in this way, like, hmm. through this, like, lunatic, you know, lens. Yeah, it's, I, I think we could probably go on for another hour of like, what would a Christianity that has some balls the way Islam does look like? But mm. there's probably no point trying to delve in there. But it is a, like there's a line in the middle of it when it starts, the period where he first starts to be talked around by this, um, this um, what's his name? The guy who converts him to Islam. Um, Rediger. Rediger. He, he, um, before that, those chapters begin, there's a line of, uh, if Islam is not political, it is nothing from uh, Khomeini, Ayatollah Khomeini. Mm -hmm. And uh, it did get me thinking of like, okay, well, what would a, a, a strong, virile, politi politicized Christianity look like? I don't know if you have thoughts on that, but it's, it's maybe too long to get into. Well, yeah, I mean, like it would have, like, I think, um, Honestly, my view is that like probably uh, Christianity would have been fine, but there are like major secular institutional attacks on it. Like so, you know, it is constantly pushed out of uh, various like school, all of these things. Like and and the culture itself is just so you know militantly secular. Like now that it's mm. and it's like I I and, like I don't want to live in a theocracy either. By the way, you know, I'm not saying that at all. Like I actually don't believe in that. But like as someone who uh, I just I I appreciate that like you know, religion has an important role in people's lives. Like, and, and for me, like the problem in the West is that there's such an attempt to take it away from people. Like when they really shouldn't like, like, especially for people who don't really, you know, pe most people aren't going to spend hours reading philosophy or, mm. you know, doing whatever, like they need like something that's kind of off the shelf. And like, what's mm. happened in the West is we've, we've taken that away from people. Like, whereas they don't want to take the Islam away from people. Do you notice that they're not really attacking that the same way? Oh, um, not at all. Yeah. You know, so, it's it's like they're they're promoting it like if anything you know and, and they're, they're tearing down the other thing so i think christianity would be in a much stronger state it, like i know people say like because of nietzsche and all this stuff like in like that we god is dead and everything that you know there's no religion that's the reason religion is gone i actually don't think so i think it, more of it's got to do with the fact that there's an institutional agenda to stop religion you know hmm. the West. there's there's also a facet of islam uh where and i don't know how much this counts in christianity maybe there's a version of christianity or something but islam uh, one of the counter jihad criticisms of islam is that islam isn't just a religion it's a prescription for your whole life to the way you brush your teeth to to fight, praying five times a day which you know a lot of like uh, crystal you know these women with who like believe in crystals and stuff probably would agree that grounding yourself meditation five times a day is good it's got a much more kind of um now i sound like a retiger but uh if I could convert you to Islam, we both convert to Islam before the stream's over. Um, take our shahad as live would be the ultimate. Yeah, but irony. Like people but, had all this, like they had a lot of this stuff, like before. Hmm. You know what I mean? The, the, before, like the, uh, especially in the the pre war years, like there was a lot of religion. Like you know, women did like although there were some of them in the factories too. Like, but you know, there was this sense that like men could ge generally like have an income and have hmm. an you know in a regular factory, and they could have a wife at home, and she could live she may have to, to do some work you know as a you know on the side as well but generally she was at home and she was working hard but she was at home and like now she's working hard but she's not at home you know yeah. so it's it's just a balance like it's it's like you know again that's I institutional mean, i know you said you wouldn't like to live in a theocracy but the thing that's jumping out at me is that for for christianity or catholicism whatever to be kind of um competitive it would need to be the thing that it's missing is prescriptiveness you know, mm. this idea that it's a thing, well, you just choose to believe in God and you go to Mass once a week and pray a little bit and it's kind of that's it. In a way, can't, I suppose, in a vacuum of liberalism, can't compete with Islam, which is prescriptive, um, mm. to make for a strong... It's not just about, well, you choose... You have the comfort that you kind of believe... Like we talked about earlier, you choose to believe in God and it makes you kind of happy. But is mm. that enough compared to the strength and vigor of Islam, which which yeah, wants it's, it's to ritual, prescribe... It's ritualized. Yeah. Like, and that, that's what Islam has is it still has the ritual element whereas a lot of the a lot of the a lot of the ritual element has been like Catholicism had an awful lot of ritual in it like and, and it, even Catholicism has a whole lot of pagan stuff in it like rituals mm. and uh, like France would have been Catholic and um so when that's gone like a lot of the meaning goes with the with the ritual like because those are things which have been done for centuries like and then they mm. just stopped doing them like there used to be rituals that the church used to do in Ireland that all went out with Vatican II for example like 
Mm. And um, and there's even there's even all these like if you go to every European country like uh, in parts of like uh, Europe like there's like these Azores they have this completely different like uh, religious ceremony where they uh, it's called the Spirito de Santos where they do this whole thing about the Holy Spirit like it's the only I think it's the only place I've ever seen the Holy Spirit kind of promoted like as its own thing they have a whole festival mm. to do with this and this has got mm. nothing to do with the church really they actually don't even the church doesn't even take part in this but it mm. is a Catholic thing. But it is not act. But it's it's just it's a local religion itself, like almost, you know. And that's what that's what the is the Muslims have this because they have the, the praying five times a day, and the Westerners don't have any of this now. So a lot of the meaning is lost when you don't have mm -hmm. the ritual kind of re repeat the you know you actually physically move your body like to do a certain movement, a certain ritual like it's like in mass where people get up, they kneel down, you know, whatever. Like a lot of that is gone, and that that therefore it's religion seems to lose a lot of its uh, meaning because of that. Hmm. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. General takeaways. Good book. Um, but kind of the black pill is kind of um, I think it's good. And I think it was valuable in a kind of I'll be frank in a propaganda sense for the, the liberals, for the normies, so to speak, for whatever to just to kind of I think that sold 650,000 copies, maybe in France alone. So a lot of people read it, which is actually very interesting. If so many people in France have read this, how can they not be like red pilled i don't want to use the word radicalized again the ngos will come down on me but yeah, yeah. um how can they like how can they, 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 people be like mass have on ma read this book on a mass basis and there not be like um revolution going on in a sense it's strange like you know to even read this and just go oh yeah okay interesting I know, yeah. controversial i know because you're reading it and you're almost going like you know yeah you get it and now what? Yeah. You know what I mean? What's go, oh, let's do something, you know? And yeah. it's like, uh, well, uh, nothing happened. You know what I mean? Like the election yeah. happened and Le Pen got wiped out by Macron. They voted for this like Rothschild banker guy, you know, in reality. Whereas in reality, like you would have, like, uh, you know, you would assume that like there should have been mass, even socialists surely would have been thinking, okay, this has got too far. Like, you know, but I just, it must be ideologically, people are just so wedded to some of these uh these voting patterns like you know but maybe maybe that's where the book is slightly unrealistic in a sense maybe the orwellian ending of everybody just converts to islam isn't actually realistic and he's kind of wrong uh not that it's a thesis he's doing it's just a, a novel but like you know um that like a question i had is that okay he speaks to like the secret service guy and he speaks to Rediger and they kind of basically pass off the argument that well because um the islam is kind of based there's a bit of white sharia or not you know europe euro sharia yeah. going on uh, all the nationalists were like yeah it's tried it's cool and i'm like that's too much of a, a kind of a sweeping point to just gloss over that there's a lot of nationalists who wouldn't have gone down that way so what happened to them throughout the course of this novel i'm like where did they go to for one yeah most people um, won't have two wives like yeah you know so I, exactly so it's like there, <laughs> because there, he's like, in the elite like almost yeah, there's he basically pretends that there is no resistance, um, and that's how it goes, which is just a little bit as interesting it is uh, as it is as a novel. It's like that's kind of missing in it. You're like, mm. it's not gonna not not so fast kind of thing. Like, is my is ultimate he, take. But is he right though? Like, is like I know there's a kind of resistance, but in reality, like European countries are just sleepwalking into this future, really, in a way. Like, mm. not, maybe not exactly like he says, but like they are kind of not voting like i suppose there's the afd and these things like but there's not like uh like there's not blood in the streets do you know what i mean and, and it's almost yeah. like it's just it's just based on breeding patterns it's just going to demographically alter and then in yeah. a few years it would be no going back i mean and i suppose it. there is blood on the streets <laughs> where when you look at the likes of um uh stuff like charlie Hebdo, and then you look yeah. at new zealand right your man nutcase uh, obviously so are the hebdo guys no it's a bit glib to just dis dismiss them both as nutcases but they're they're a symptom of of this clash of civilizations these kind of outbursts and uh these kind of um these kind of surreal violence or this kind of surreal violence that emerges bit by bit but i maybe you're kind of arguing that that could happen sporadically but ultimately the direction is still the same direction we're going in um i don't know it's uh, again it comes down to to me the most interesting is at a individual level when you meet a person who agrees with you entirely i'm not going to name names or point fingers at the kind of people i'm talking about i think you might have an idea when when people are in a position where they want to assert themselves and you meet them individually and they keep couching themselves and all of that that's where the rubber hits the road for me because i look at like political parties and voting and all of that mm. like the machiavellian game of how we take power and i'm like okay whatever the main thing for me is when i meet people at an individual level who i know privately agree and all of that 
they're faced th- with a situation. Uh, I'm talking about asylum towns, right? Um, mm-hmm. Where it's it couldn't be more obvious. Um, uh, stuff like that, and they yet they they are they they will stress this is not about anything at all. It's just about yeah. Uh, and I'm going. It's I'm sad. going like it's like it's just before we ever get to a point of political parties and Machiavellian takeovers. If that can't be, however, that weird belief yeah. system got into if, every if, normal if, person. If, if, until if, that, yeah. Until you can get that. Until you get that. Until somehow people can be like educated on how to like get themselves out of that a little bit. Then there is no hope. I mean, then Welbeck's right. Yeah, I, I, like that's the, that's exactly what I, that's actually crystallizing exactly what I was trying to say there before. That's exactly it. It's, it is that reaction. Like your town is going to be like half and half overnight, majority non-Irish. Like at least half and half. Some of these cases, like a, hundred, a town of a hundred people, a mm-hmm. hundred migrants come in from the God, you know, the depths of like the opposite side of the planet. Like, and mm-hmm. you're just like you know this is an existential thing like like this mm-hmm. is literally like ethnic warfare you are having ethnic warfare played against you you and be and it's because i think it actually it's because people cannot understand like what is actually driving it and they think it's just like well you know they accept this axiom that well it's just happening because we have obligations and there's poor people in the world and that's that's the that's the level that most people are on like well there's poor people in the world and we should help and this is the this is the way you help. Like this is the option you're given. Like mm. you're not told like, well, you know, there's going to be an extra like couple of billion people in Africa in the next twenty years. And guess what? Most of them want to come to Europe. Mm. And uh, you know, the reality is that it's the ones that have that. What would you? They were what they were what you would call middle class who want to come to Europe. It's not even poor people. Most of these most of these migrants are just migrants. It's just migrants, and it is used institutionally. At the international level, and it's because people can't grasp the international dimension. They can't grasp that it is bigger. You know, it's not just happening because Europe lost its way. It's happening mm. because there is literally a supranational institution whose sole purpose is to pump migrants into little towns like Caharsivine and and Lismore and these places. Yeah, yeah. And and yeah. that is what like I'm trying to communicate to people all the time. Like, is that you know, it's not about Varadkar. Like, you know, yeah. it's not about him or. Mm. martin or any of these other egypts like it's 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 a bigger thing like and if, yeah. if you can't express that to people like you know and yeah but yeah even the reaction even when that happens and they don't know why it's happening they still don't say well i, I i'm not i'm okay with it happening as long as the government talks to me about it first yeah but what they what they, what like, they obviously really mean is if they talk to me about it first and give me a chance i would say no and uh, so it's going around in circles and you're like yeah. like like why not just come out and say just like we all know, like we all just know what off, you're like. trying to say. <laughs> just, just like I know, but like you, the person in the town, like we all know what you want to say. Just, just, just say it. Just say it. And the fear is massive. Uh, and even, even if you, you could be talking to someone who is like, uh, I don't know, you could be talking to someone who won the Euro Millions and they're rich and they are happy and they are, they have a home and all of this. Uh, like there could be no practical implication. You've got a lot of people on pensions and stuff. And yet, still, so you're like, there's actually no practical thing there. That'd be one thing if it was your job or whatever. Sometimes people don't have that, and yet still, the fear grips them. And um, to me, I would say so. We might as well finish up, right? Because I think the chat, and I'll probably need to, and and you two will need to head off. But you know, I think you, it's kind of like, uh, you know, with the people, it's like the feeling of it. It reasserts for me the feeling of of ambition and of of not accepting the black pill and not accepting basically it's like the resistance will continue like Welbeck is wrong and i don't like down to the last man i would not you know i sound like a counter jihadist i'm not a whatever about islam but i would you know it, it, we don't go away like that and ultimately the enemy in this book is not islam anyway it's the it's these intellectuals it's people to be honest like um francois Mm-hmm. even exactly. him yeah. they are the enemies those are the people that need to be cleared out um cleared out peacefully <laughs> and uh and uh, just cleared out of power because they they stare this thing in the face like francois does he knows everything he's not ignorant and he stares it in the face right to the end and is just self-absorbed depressed and uh yeah. and he just stares it in the face right to the end and then just walks over and kind of shrugs um for, for his, his own game of 
of the liberal paradigm for as long as it, it is there. He rides the train to the very end and then he just hops on the next one. Yeah, exactly. So it's these, it, that's, I think that's the message of the book. Uh, will we leave it there? Yeah, absolutely. I, we'll go to three o'clock in the morning, will we? <laughs> Yeah, yeah no, um, I maybe, maybe, maybe if there was alcohol involved. Well, were... um, okay, uh, thanks everybody for watching. Thanks, Don, for joining me. And uh, I've left, okay. obviously, I think it's silly to say because your link's in the description, but I think everybody here knows. Um, and subscribe to me, subscribe to Don, all of that. Uh, Ihawai, everybody. Thanks for watching. See ya.